At this time, I'd like to ask Professor Fisher uh, to return to the podium for his presentation on curing the addiction of growth. Great to be here. Um, and I'm glad to see that things at uh, Syracuse University are like Wharton. Everybody grab, gravitates to the back rows <laughs> and maybe Cornell also. Um, and how appropriate that I'm talking about something where Vishal Gore was uh, one of my, Dean Gore, <laughs> uh, one of my co-authors. Um, our other co-author was Herb Klemberger, who has an MBA from the Wharton School. So this is a, a, a Wharton team. Um, and if you find this interesting, you can read more about it in Harvard Business Review in this article shown here. Um, so this is a real common graph that depicts lots of things uh, that organizations and companies, including retailers, go through, which is a life cycle of, um, in, in the case of retailing, a startup. And if you happen to have a good idea and you click with customers, you can experience rapid growth, super rapid growth, like 50% a year. Um, and then at some point that flattens out and declines. I started working with retailers in uh, 1995 um, with Vishal. <laughs> um, and at that point, a lot of the well-known retailers had been founded in the, in the 70s. You think of Limited, Gap, Nine West, uh, Staples, Urban Outfitters, and they were all still red hot and growing uh, 20 years later. Um, and at some point, I, it occurred to me, you know, what's going to happen to these folks at some point in time? They can't keep growing at this rate forever. And that was the thought I teamed with Bishal and Herb that led to this paper of how do you think about when inevitably a company goes from super fast growth to to maturity, okay? Um, super fast growth is, is well illustrated by Walmart, okay? Their first 20 years, they grew 43% a year, okay? Um, this overlay store growth and the store count was pretty much the same. So they were driving growth just by opening new stores. I shouldn't say just by opening your source, that's not easy to do, but, but that was the engine of growth, okay? Um, this overlays profitability, which was also growing at 43%. So to a first order, they were running the business through a copy machine, turning out more and more copies of, of their stores, okay? Um, a question. This is one of these questions we love to ask where we can spend an hour looking up the answer. And you got 30 seconds to think of the answer. Um, but what would Walmart's revenue be, do you think in 2022, if they had kept growing at 43% a year? Show of hands. So how many vote for the first one? 10 to 50 trillion. Uh, number two, 51 to 100 trillion. Number three, uh, 100 to bigger number. Okay, and how, number four, I guess, is everybody, right? You, you got it. <laughs> uh, the answer was uh, was actually bigger than a, a hundred, than a thousand trillion. It would have been uh, 2,000 trillion. Uh, ain't going to happen, obviously. It would have been mul multiples of the world GDP can't happen. And in fact, it was uh, 572 million. A good friend of mine, Edwin Kay, had worked as um, a chief supply chain officer at, um, at Walmart for a number of years. And he said they used to talk about a trillion as somewhere down the road. They've not gotten to that yet. Okay. So growth has to level off, okay? Uh, that happened with Walmart and pretty precipitously, if you look at that graph, right? It's just going straight up and then hit a wall and flattens out in 2011, okay? And, and so here's the question Vishal and I thought about 
is what does the company do? What, is, what should a retailer do when that happens? Uh, uh, is life over? <laughs> You've been spending uh, decades, many decades growing at a, at a huge rate. What do you do? Okay. Um, so what should Walmart or any retailer uh, do when growth slows? Well, you look at, go back to Harvard Business Review for advice, uh, keep growing, <laughs> figure out. <laughs> if, you, if you can't figure out how to grow, <laughs> when growth slows, you're either dumb or lazy, okay? So you just you go back to the drawing board and keep growing. Um, that's what Walmart initially did, okay? Um, So 2000, how, how, do, how were they driving growth? Opening stores, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll keep doing that. <laughs> we'll open lots of stores. So they, the store count went up 29% in that year when sales only went up 14%. And you, you look back at that graph when it was growing more or less linearly up and up and they opened X percent more stores and revenue would go up by X percent. Okay, when they hit the wall, if you open 29% more st stores, revenue goes up by half that, okay? Um, they did a lot of global expansion uh, into lots of countries, including China. Uh, I, I went back, the first annual report I could find was 1972, and that was a year that year, one year, they grew 76%, okay? The word growth was mentioned four times in the, in the total annual report. Uh, 2015 uh, was a year in which uh, sales grew by almost nothing, right? And the word growth was mentioned 114 times. Uh, so, do you feel like they're nervous about lack of growth? <laughs> uh, we're growing, we're growing, we're growing. Um, you look at 2016, revenue declined, first year when it declined, and the CEO's letter, that's a quote, we're a growth company, we're still gonna grow. So they're following, they're following this advice. They're saying growth is slowed, maybe it's temporary, we'll, we'll fix it, we'll keep growing, okay? <clears throat> um, are they right? Is the question, right? Is that, is that the right answer? When growth slows, just push harder on the growth pedal, open more stores, keep working at it. Uh, that's the question Vishal and I and Herb sought to answer. <clears throat> I was going to say we, really, Vishal <laughs> collected data on um, 37 publicly traded retailers. Um, <clears throat> they, we, chose them to have, well, you can read their, the, the criterion, but they were retailers that had been growing at double digits and seen it slow to mid single digits on average. So growing at 15, 20% a year, now, now growing at something like 5% a year. Um, we excluded any retailer that had had five years of decline, five years of decline in revenue, thinking they were on the downward slope. We, we made one mistake in that, does, any, does anybody know a retailer that had five years of decline and now is doing quite well? Best Buy, remember we got rid of Best Buy. <laughs> they bounced back with a vengeance. So, uh, so they were an interesting, uh, footnote, I guess, mistake, whatever you want to call it to our research. Um, here's the list. And we separated them um, by how they were doing in terms of total stock return. So 37 retailers, uh, 17 winners, um, and 20 not winners. And what the columns show is total annual stock return over this five-year period we looked at, and revenue growth. And what's very interesting, 
the the winners grew their their, their stock return was twenty one percent. So that's growth in the stock plus dividends and everything. The way uh, finance folks, which Fischl knows more about than me, <laughs> define total return. Okay, uh, the losers two two point eight percent. So factor of ten difference. Yet their top line growth was almost identical. Right. So that sort of answered the first question. You don't have to curl up and die if growth moderates to single digits, because both groups are growing at around 5%. Yet one group is seeing average share stock return of north of 20%, which is really good. So that's kind of interesting. So then the, the question becomes, how do these guys on the left do it, right? Uh, it turned out there was the ones shown here uh, were people that we had contacts. So I think there were seven other retailers where we knew, knew people, uh, all listed here. Um, and we interacted with them. We called them up, told them about our idea. In most cases, we knew these people from prior work with retailers. Um, and uh, and they all sort of told a consistent story that they'd all gone through this period like Walmart was in of seeing growth slow and fumbling a little bit and then quote unquote figuring it out. And they all told their stories of what figuring it out meant. Um, but the first person we reached out to was Ken Hicks, who I had known previously. Uh, he'd been a chief operating officer at Payless Shoes um, and then had taken over at Foot Locker. Um, and, and Foot Locker was an interesting comparison point, which I'll get to in a minute, because Finish Line was their number one competitor, right? So Foot Locker was rocking and finish line uh, was not doing so hot, right? So 2% stock growth versus uh, 30, north of 30%. So how, you know, both in the same business, both seeing the same revenue growth, yet one is a superstar and one is not, what are they doing? Um, if we had a smaller group, I could ask you for thoughts, but a common answer is, well, cost cutting. Right, they cut costs um, to to grow profit. This is their sh the share price. This is when uh, Ken Hicks took over as CEO, and the blue line shows the the growth in share price. Uh, he retired November twenty twenty four, uh, and then he was executive chairman through May of two thousand fifteen. Um, and so we reached out to him and met at his house in Greenwich in, in June 2015. Perfect timing, because picture a guy who's had this massive career working 80 hours a week for, for six years, and now he's sitting around retired. What is he going to do with his time? So we show up. We must have talked for like three hours, didn't we, Michelle? Um, and he kind of told us his story. We showed him, uh, well, We'd done some homework prior to that. We looked at the last four years of financials. This is a little dense, so I'll parse it for you. Uh, revenue grew 8%, as shown on an earlier slide. <clears throat> Operating income grew 20.4%. So that explains the stock performance, the financial market performance, right? You, you get a multiple of earnings, which is uh, increased if you've got high growth, um, so the multiple, the, the stock grew to north of 30%, the multiple went up a little bit and they were growing earnings. So the, the old fashioned way, right? Your stock return is a multiple of your earnings. Um, so then the question is, how did they grow operating income by 20% with revenue growing 8%? And the answer is right there. They grew expenses 6.7%. Now, 1.3% sounds like almost nothing, right? It sounds like it rounds to zero. 
but it turns out it has a big impact on profit because you look down here, uh, their uh, operating income was 9.8% of revenue. So that 1.3% of 9.8% was a, um, somehow, uh, yeah, it was a 13 and a quarter percent operating income growth. So you got the 8% revenue growth, you scale everything up, and then you've got this differential. You're growing expenses slower than you're growing revenue, gives you another 13 and a quarter percent, gets you to 20%. Okay. Uh, I would have, without seeing these numbers, thought 1.3%, that's like rounds to zero. But it actually turns out to be quite powerful. So, uh, so we showed this uh, to Ken and said, you know, this is what we saw in your numbers. Is that, is that how you think about it? And he said, absolutely. That's how I think about it. Um, but I, he had rules of thumb, grow inventory half as fast as revenue, grow uh, controllable expenses 70% as fast as sales. He kept using the word leverage. What do you mean by leverage? Well, I've got, you know, here are my assets, inventory, store associates, real estate. Uh, I can leverage. And, and we pressed him, well, how low can you go, right? <laughs> What if you just grew not at all? And he said, I don't think that would work. But he acknowledged as little as 2%. So this is not no growth. It's low growth. Uh, I can work with that. I can improve profitability more than 2% if you give me 2% top line growth. We met with the uh, CEO and CFO of Macy's at one point, uh, Terry Lundgren and Karen Hogan. And, and Karen said, you know, uh, Terry and I argue over like 1% difference. So yeah, we've got low growth, but that growth is meaningful. And some parts of our business will be growing 10%. Some will be flat, some will be declining. But uh, that that's not zero. It's, it's so important that we'll have debates. Should it be 2%, 3%, 4% as our target? Okay. Um, approach to leverage. He looked at the store base and um, oh, and one thing I forgot to mention, um, if you look at where their uh, growth and revenue came from, there are two ways a retailer can grow. One is open more stores. We talked about that. That was what Walmart did in their early years. But the other way is to drive more revenue through their existing stores. That's called comparable store sales growth or comp. The retailers will talk about we're comping at 3% this year, which is a good number. 3% comp is a good number. I think most of their growth came through comps. I think they comped in the summary slide I showed you at something like 7.9%. Uh, um, so they rationalized the store base. They worked a lot on making things work better in the stores to drive more sales to the stores. Uh, they grew their dot-com business. So that's another component is, I realize to many of you youngsters in the back row, uh, bricks and mortar is like last year, but <laughs> most bricks and mortar retailers will have a dot-com business, which is growing faster than their bricks and mortar business. And they'll integrate that with the store. So they did that. Um, and they were very mindful about the hiring process, store associates. They'd get 1,000 applicants each month for jobs. They'd bring in 300, had some thoughtful uh, interview process, and would hire maybe 50 of those. So they hired really good people, uh, trained them really well. Um, uh, and, and then they tried to take work out of the stores. So we asked, well, well, you know, how do you do that? Or give us an example. And he showed us this device, which the typical, these guys are selling shoes, right? Remember that? Uh, you know, we all buy shoes. <laughs> uh, even with the internet, you still have to go to a store, try them on, or not always. You can buy three pairs, return two, 
but the, for those that went to the store, uh, the store says it might make five trips to the back room. One pair didn't fit quite right. They'd go back, get some more, come back again. With this device, they could see what was in their back room and what was in the back room of other stores. So it reduced that time, trips spent shuffling back and forth between the back room, which meant they had more time to sell, uh, which drove a 2% sales increase, okay? So again, 2% doesn't sound like a huge number, but they were doing many projects like this. So it was very much a game of, of inches. Um, and we press Ken, well, you know, it sounds pretty reasonable and straightforward. Why doesn't everybody do this? And he said, well, you know, it's not sexy. Um, I'm probably dating myself mentioning Vince Lombardi, but he was a, one of the best football coaches at one point in time. And he basically said, if you block and tackle well, you win football games. He was all about discipline. Um, and that's what this is all about. Uh, in fact, Ken uh, was an undergraduate at West Point. He played football at West, at West Point and then got an MBA at Harvard Business School. And he was what's called a long snapper that, believe it or not, it's so important when you're punting, it's a long snap. And, and if you screw that up, it's bad <laughs> and it's hard to do. So they'll have one person that just does that. Um, and, it's, and this typifies Ken's personality. You just don't want to screw up. So he's very cautious, very careful. And, and one of the comments he made was what you say no to is as important as the things you do. So they'll have maybe 10 good ideas, they'll only do one, which means they're saying no to nine not bad ideas, but they're very thoughtful and cautious about that. Um, and so we said, well, give us an example. And he said, Macy's came to us and wanted us to have a footlocker uh, foot presence in the Macy's stores. Uh, so first thought is that drives incremental revenue. It's a good idea. Second thought is, well, that's going to cannibalize the footlocker stores. And they earn less money in the Macy's store because they have to pay a percentage to Macy's. Um, and they figured out if they could only do it in a subset of the Macy's stores, it would have worked. But even at 5% cannibalization, it was not a great idea. So they said no. Um, and Ken's a very colorful uh, character. You read the last line. He said, you know, two pigs at a trough, no one goes hungry. You got three pigs, one of, one of them is going hungry. It's probably not going to be Macy's. And it's probably not going to be our suppliers. It's going to be us. Uh, Along comes finish line sports, and they said, yeah, we love this idea, incremental revenue. It's the best thing we've ever done, greatest idea we've ever done. A uh, little bit later, it was a disaster it, that turned out uh, Foot Locker was right. It cannibalized their sales, hurt their revenue, and they ended up firing their CEO. And if you look at, this is red line is uh, Foot Locker share price and blue line is finish line, uh, huge divergence. And um, how am I doing on time? Got time, all right, good. Um, so th this is similar to what I showed you before, where a small difference between revenue growth and operating expense growth can be hugely impactful on earnings. Turns out that works in reverse <laughs> also. Uh, finish line went the other way. They grew revenue 9.5%. Uh, they grew expenses 11%. So that small difference um, caused uh, operating income to actually decline. Right? If you look, now circle back. To our uh, sample. Um, if you, you look at growth in revenue. 
versus growth in operating income for the winners, the successful retailers, uh, the difference was a mere 0.4 percent. Whereas for the losers, uh, it was a um, a negative 0.4 percent. So the winners were growing revenue by 4.7 seven percent in expenses by 4.3 percent the losers were doing the reverse right sounds small but as we saw in those two examples it's it's usually impactful so with apologies to dickens <laughs> for corrupting his quote you know he's the one who said spend a little more than you make is misery spend a little less than you earn is happiness and that's what we saw here um so we could think of these two stages, uh, growth as kind of scale. You're scaling the business. You've got something that works. All you got to do is, is multiply it well, as, as long as it works until eventually you saturate uh, demand for your concept. You saturate places to put stores and growth is going to flatten out. And that's where you shift to a different strategy, which using Ken Hicks words might be leverage. You leverage your stores, your inventory, uh, your brand, and all kinds of things to drive more sales uh, through more sales without growing expense. Um, McDonald's was one of the companies we interviewed that went through a period of um, denying that growth had ended. And when they finally got religion, they, they believe strongly in this concept. And this is a graph they constructed that they gave me that talks about the much greater profitability you get by driving more sales through your existing stores than by simply adding stores. So the easiest way to put revenue points up is open a store. The hardest way uh, is drive more sales through your, through your existing stores, but it's also the most profitable way. Um, and uh, Rob Marshall, who is my good friend and colleague or contact with McDonald's, made an interesting point. He said in that growth phase, that's an execution game. That's an execution game. You're constantly got a to-do list. Uh, you're constantly opening stores. The leverage game, how can I drive more revenue through my existing source? You have to be more mindful. That's more, requires more thought and insight. So the execution game is exciting. A lot going on, <laughs> a lot of action, you're opening stores. The, how do I make my stores more effective? Is more, you gotta be more thoughtful, was his comment. Um, this was this slide really uh, was given to me by Karen Hogan, who is CFO at Macy's, that she used um, for annual planning. Um, and and it, as she and Terry Lundgren, the CEO, described it, it's almost like they had a pile of two hundred million dollars on the table in front of them. And how are we going to spend it? We got this much cash available. How are we going to spend it? Um, and so they would identify two, two kind of lists, places where we could open new stores and things we could do to enhance uh, sales within our existing stores, improve our assortment, inventory management, pricing, uh, store associates, training, how you hire, all kinds of things. Um, and, and then they would simply evaluate all of those for return on invested capital um, and choose the best ones, okay? So they were agnostic as to opening stores versus driving comp sales. But she said, what happens as you mature, if you run this process, you don't have to be thinking, do I need to change strategies? Your strategy will do it for you because you'll find more and more improvement opportunities with existing stores than opening new stores as you begin to fill your store space. And you got more stores, so you improve 
uh, in your existing store base, you drive revenue. And then the last thing they do, which is somewhat controversial, uh, and Karen said many of their competitors don't do this, is they return money to shareholders. It's sometimes viewed negatively, I guess, in the finance community. Michelle's nodding. <laughs> um, but if they can't employ the capital more pro profitably within the business, then they return it to shareholders. Uh, no, how do you drive more revenue through your existing stores? Uh, simple, just buy that book right up to, sorry, shame, <laughs> buy that book and read some of the key chapters, but it's uh, what assortment do you carry, how you manage inventory, store labor, price, and uh, developing omni-channel, developing your, your dot-com business and integrating it. Um, interestingly enough, we found this graph has a, a stage in the middle that you would call denial. We, we illustrated that with Walmart, right? As the growth slowed, they doubled down on everything they were doing to grow. They didn't say, oh, growth is slow, let's change strategies. They said, oh, no, we'll, we'll figure out how to keep growing. We saw that in virtually all of the retailers we talked with. Uh, Home Depot, a uh, famously hired Bob Nardelli, who, uh, as they were maturing and growth was slowing, and he doubled down on everything they had done to grow uh, with pretty disastrous results, as you can see in their share price. Uh, and he was fired. He was fired, and they uh, uh, brought in uh, Blake who some people say is a, one of the best retail CEOs, maybe best CEOs, um, Frank Blake in, in history. And he stopped everything they were doing to force growth. They bought a supply company, he sold that. They had stores that were scheduled to open and he stopped that. He said, we're not gonna open new stores, we're not gonna force growth. We're gonna squeeze more profit out of our, our existing stores. So he very much, made a conscious change, but that only happened after a four or five year period of denial that growth had ended. Uh, same story with McDonald's. Um, as growth started to slow, stock price declined, they kept trying to force growth. Uh, I thought Jay Leno's remark was rather cruel they have a new item on their dollar menu, their stock. Uh, but then they changed CEOs who said, you know, no, we're not gonna force growth. That his mantra was better, not bigger. Uh, so they also went through this same, same period. Um, back to Walmart, maybe end with saying a few nice things about them. Uh, they're doing quite well now. Um, they, uh, had an, a new CEO, uh, Doug McMillan, who in 2016 made a conscious uh, decision that we need to change our game and focus more on profitability rather than top line growth. Uh, and, and I interacted around this with my friend uh, Edwin Kay, who had been uh, uh, chief operating officer for Walmart Global Procurement. So he ran sourcing for Walmart out of, out of Shenzhen and was an insider. And you can read that uh, some of the things that uh, Doug McMillan did, that red box was the negative period, the denial period, 2011, 2015, where they were continuing to force growth when it wasn't 30 bad, rather than accept that and work on profitability. Uh, and the green bar is, shows their share price. So the blue, blue bars are comp, comparable store sales growth, which was up and down, but basically zero, okay? Um, and Doug McMillan changed strategy, and you can see that they have healthy comp store sales growth and, uh, and stock price. So um, 
recap, retailers and, and possibly other organizations go through life stages, birth, growth, maturity. Uh, and between growth and maturity, the hard part is recognizing when it's time to, to uh, change strategies. Another example, uh, Michelle Dillard told us, Dillard's grew very successfully through acquisitions. And when they knew they'd hit a wall is when the, they did their, what in retrospect they realized is their last acquisition, which was a disaster. And that was the point when they said, okay, we're not gonna keep opening stores, buying stores, we're gonna work with what we've got and leverage those assets. Um, and then the key points, um, very small differences in revenue growth and operating profit and operating costs can be extremely impactful. That the process that the successful retailers use, they called disciplined capital allocation, which is basically flow your money to the best ways to grow. And if you don't have a good way to use it, re return it to shareholders, which requires some um, discipline. Um, so anyhow, that's my story. We found it, Vishal and I, it's a pleasure working with you on this. And do you want to add anything? That... Okay. <laughs> uh, and do we do questions or? Yes. Okay. If, if there are any questions. Yeah. So questions for Professor Fisher. I think I, um, I think we can kind of see what's going on. I, think, I don't know all the numbers, but Staples seems to be going through the same kind of a uh, process right now. They had that rapid growth, and then they had a decline, and now we see them kind of divesting themselves of some parts of business to yeah, increase very possibly. Their, 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 their profitability. Yeah, very possibly. Tom Stenberg founded Staples. Uh -huh. uh, he, and he was a Harvard Business School grad. And he said the hardest thing he ha had to do founding Staples was to tell his mother how with a Harvard Business School MBA, he was going to go work for a retailer. <laughs> Uh, but he was, but he had a good run, and and then he sadly deceased a few years ago. Great. Well, one question here: um, How would you know you growed enough without waiting for the negative market reaction? Is is that five year? Instead of denial, call it a realization period, necessary because we've seen many retailers go through that period where it's not clear that that you've grown enough and it's easy to look back and see that you had five years of of no growth i'm not sure if there is a way to know more quickly it may be that 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 um five years soul searching to come to the realization that the data has finally spoken to us <laughs> We have to change strategies. But that would be an interesting research topic. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> a little sooner. I have a question here. Marshall, I can ask another question, um, building on Karcha's question and, and reflecting on the work we did. Um, that um, it, Does it take a different kind of CEO or a different culture or mentality of a company to uh, to be focusing on top line growth versus bottom line growth. Um, I think we found that, didn't we? I think we found that. Um, Frank Blake was very different from Bob Nardelli, for example. Uh, all of these sea changes, or many of them, came with a change in CEO uh, and a different strategy. Uh, I mean, Ken Hicks was a model of thoughtfulness and caution, and um, which is very different from the go-go high growth. The, the one example may be Dillard's. I guess if your name's on the store, <laughs> you're not going to change CEOs. And But maybe when the their next generation took over, that might have been not a change in family, but a change in CEOs. I think it does. Here's a question. 
Um, so I have a question about um, your data set that you include 37. Uh, I'm so glad I have you here, Vishal. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a question about those, those firms who haven't uh, been publicly traded yet. For example, Chick-fil-A um, compared to McDonald's, right? So there may be some growth. It is actually has been going before they even been public. Um, how would you, how would you think about that? And also, well, I'm I'm not sure I understand your question. So there are uh, there are firms that are not uh, publicly being traded. The stock they're not really in public. They don't have any IPO yet. Right. So they probably have been growing. Right. Before you even see it. Uh, right. Yeah, that's my yep. question. And Chick Fil A is probably a I think it's probably a good example because has been growing for a long time, has probably yes. doing something good. Yeah, right. so you're, I guess, making a couple of points. We were more or less, we couldn't get around working with publicly traded retailers uh, because you get so much more data. Uh, private retailers, you unless you have an inside contact, but even there, I've got some inside contacts at private retailers and there's a reason why they haven't gone public. <laughs> they don't want to publicize their data. So you, when we do research, I think that's point one. When you do research, much easier to work with, with public companies. And then I think the other point you're making is it's not the space McDonald's was in that stopped growing. It was just McDonald's as a company. But there can be other people with a, a different menu option, a different format, a different approach. Um, that that can enter that space and continue to grow. Because let's face it, we all like new shiny objects when we shop. Another question. Okay. Perhaps another key takeaway, <clears throat> Professor, might be that how one defines growth, and maybe some um, have got the definition of growth wrong if it's growing sales, but really we need to be growing profit. You, need, you should be growing profit. Right. Most retailers curiously think about it in terms of top line growth. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Thank you. Um, we're going to continue with our program with Michael Kulikowski. Um, he's the Vice President of Global Logistics Services, and he's going to give us a little bit more of information on what Coca-Cola does and kind of differences they make. So I also want to mention, too, I, I talked with Mike earlier, and I asked him the question that always is, is interesting to me, is there a, really a secret formula for Coke, and does it is it does everybody know it, but they just can't use it? Because no, there really is a secret. And I, I think if it'd be interesting if you could explain, this is a really complex formula. It's not just like two parts of this and one part of that and mix them together. This is really quite um, quite impressive how they've, how they've created this formula. So maybe you can take a few minutes to talk about that as well, Mike. Okay. So um, Michael Kulikowski from Coca-Cola. So first of all, fantastic to be here at Syracuse, birthplace of the first formal supply chain degree as well, dating back to 1919, as you mentioned. And I'd definitely like to thank uh, Dean Alex McKelvey, Vice Chancellor Michael Haney, Gary LaPointe, Susan Dean, Julie Niederhoff, Don McWilliams, faculty, everybody who's helped uh, me prepare uh, for, for being here and presenting to all of you. Uh, as well as the students I had the opportunity to meet as well. So Lauren, Sam, Ileana, Adele, and Ryan, looking forward to your presentation uh, here shortly later on this afternoon. So what's interesting being here and, and speaking to all of you, I had the opportunity to do such engagements before, which, which is fantastic. I absolutely uh, love to do these things, but I do, I, am, I tend to be a bit of an introvert. So it's not always comfortable being up here, but I love sharing stories. And <clears throat> as I go to these different events, so whether it's customer panels, uh, different presentations, meeting different logistics professionals throughout my career, what's very interesting is that most people that I've talked to didn't seek out logistics, didn't seek out supply chain uh, as their primary career choice, right? They were either in marketing or finance, studying legal, wanting to be doctors, but somehow they ended up in logistics and they stayed in logistics. 
And I would say that's roughly about 90% of the people I meet and I've talked to as well. So like anything else, I'm always interested in stories. And I wanted to, to talk a little bit about myself, my story, and how I got into, into logistics. So there I was, <clears throat> surrounded by thousands of people, heads bobbing up and down, fists pumping in the air, right? People were marching all around, chanting these words that could be heard for miles around. The adrenaline, I mean, it was rushing through my veins, you know, anger, energy, leaving my body in this very extreme style of dancing. As people were falling, we were helping each other up, picking everybody up. And if I simply paused, and took a minute and I looked across the sea of people, they were all interacting with one another with a common purpose. The look on their faces was that of joy, pleasure, happiness, but also purpose, all aligned together for one common cause. The music was loud, the vocals were clear, the message resounding. And I thought to myself, I finally made it. I finally got to see the band that I could totally relate to. This was the summer of 1997, and I intended my very first Rage Against the Machine concert. <laughs> I was entering my junior year at the University of Maryland, and it was during the mid to late 90s that this story, that band, more or less summarized who I was back then, and to a degree who I am today. And then as much as I love that band Rage Against the Machine, I now find myself working for the machine. But I tell you one thing, I do love it. I truly, truly love it because it is that desire to challenge the status quo, ask those tough questions, questioning the why not, why can't we do this? Not accepting no for an answer. This is what has gotten me to where I am today. It is that mindset, it is that attitude. It's my refusal to join and perpetuate that good old boy network that you find in so many of these, these companies. So being a bit of a nonconformist, bit of a rebel, this is how I found myself in supply chain. So back in the 90s, while studying at the University of Maryland, there was no supply chain degree at the time. Right? Everyone was going for finance, marketing, accounting, herds of students jumping over one another, trying to be the best in those respective <clears throat> degrees. You know, with all due respect, I was not one of those. I didn't wanna be in that rat race. So instead, as I'm going through the curriculum, I'm looking at the bottom, towards the end of the alphabet, there's this degree named transportation. And I figured, why not? I like trucks, I like planes, right? I like boats. Now, my grandmother used to tell me when I was three years old that I wanted to be a truck driver. So why did I wanna be a truck driver? Because you wanted to put potholes in the streets of Baltimore, right? I got so much enjoyment out of just being a little kid, being trucks. So again, that's why I figured, why not? So I ended up earning that degree in transportation, coupled along with international business. And that year, there were eight graduating seniors with that degree in transportation, and I was one of them. So from there, I ended up going back to school to earn my MBA from Georgia State University while I was working for Lucent Technologies. This was my first job right out of college. And I was highly encouraged, and I highly encourage each and every student here, if you have the opportunity and the means to do so, I highly suggest continuing your education if at all possible. But at that time, while working for Lucent, I was making $34,000 per year. I was a millionaire, but I also had to learn how to budget my finances because that $34,000 didn't go too far. But I did enjoy my time in each and every company that I worked for, right? They were universities in of themselves. I learned and I learned a lot. I learned, for example, contract law while working at Lucent. I learned operations management while consolidated container company. I learned strategic management while at Siemens. So building experience, building knowledge, learning what to do, but also learning what not to do. However, it was not until Coca-Cola that I was empowered and truly trusted to lead, to lead that logistics machine within the company. So this is now how I can make a difference, influence and that change that machine for a better future. So going from my first Rage Against the Machine concert to leading the logistics strategy for the Coca-Cola company, I'm here on behalf of the company accepting the Salzburg Award. And I'm very proud to be here and thank you for that. So our company is built on a simple purpose, 
refresh the world, and make a difference. And on top of that, I'll talk about both, but I will also mention how supply chain fits into the mix. So a little bit about the company, pretty straightforward. I don't want to read all the numbers off to you here, but bottom line, headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. We've been around for 137 years. We have over 200, a lot of bottling partners, 950 manufacturing plants. And in fact, you can find a Coca-Cola to Gary's example all over the world, with the exception of actually two countries for the longest time. Those two countries were Cuba and North Korea. Most recently, Russia is where we don't do business today. <clears throat> Coca-Cola actually also has massive, um, Coca-Cola, in terms of our product portfolio sustainability, I'll talk about that a little bit later on in the presentation. But the other thing is when you look at our products and our portfolio, right? Coca-Cola, the red can, Coca-Cola Classic, that represents nearly half of the company's revenue. The other por portions are the sparkling, the stills, coffee, teas, and most exciting are our emerging brands, which I'm going to talk to here uh, later on in the slides. Also, the Coca-Cola, to Gary's point, because we are everywhere, our footprint is pretty well diversified across the globe, as you can see there up on the screen. Now, emerging products. So I think most of you know Coca-Cola uh, as a company, but this is these are our big bets going into the future. So as we, we talked about growth in Dr. Fisher's presentation in terms of you know, having the denial and the growth and how do we continue growing? How do we reinvent ourselves? So in this case, it's exploring these other emerging markets, something that's not traditional to Coca-Cola, like for example, the alcohol beverages. How do we leverage our, our strong brands such as Topo Chico, such as Fresca, and, and enter the alcohol market uh, with those brands? Also finding the right partnerships in order to do that. What's very exciting is also the Jack Daniels and Coca-Cola. This is the first time in Coca-Cola's history that we actually co-branded our trademark with another company, with Jack Daniels. Super exciting time fantastic product, seeing significant growth in that brand. In addition to that, just I think a week or two ago, we announced our partnership with Absolute Vodka, coming out with a Sprite and Vodka product. Uh, and then, unbeknownst to me, I was driving down 85 towards work, uh, and out on the billboard, I saw Hard Peace Tea. So Peace Tea, if you're familiar with that product, I didn't even know we were going to get into the alcohol market, but it was out there on the billboard. So we're definitely testing our brands in this new space. Do we expect every brand to succeed? No, but those that do, we're absolutely going to continue investing in the space in terms of our total beverage portfolio. Next brand, Costa Coffee. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Costa Coffee, but Costa Coffee is the number one coffee brand in the United Kingdom. It's one of the top brands all throughout Europe. And this is our play in the coffee market globally. We are taking Costa globally. Now, I've been asked the question a couple of times, Mike, are you going to go head to head with Starbucks? Honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if we're going to build retail stores or not, but I can tell you we do have five re retail stores in the United States in existence. One's in New York, New York City. We have three in Atlanta. And for reasons unbeknownst to me, we have one in Seattle, uh, of all places. And I'll let you dwell on that one why it's in Seattle. What was also interesting is I was flying in yesterday. In the Syracuse airport, there is a Costa Coffee machine uh, close to the Delta terminal. So if you find yourself in the airport, I highly recommend try a Costa Coffee, try the latte, fantastic product, barista quality. Moving on, Body Armor, one of our latest acquisitions as well uh, from a few years back. This is another big, big bet for the company. Body Armor is a premium sports energy drink uh, as well. Another fantastic product, more natural ingredients <clears throat> within that beverage. And in fact, I found myself drinking Body Armor quite heavily about a week ago. I came down with the stomach flu and they have a product called Flash IV, over 2000 milligrams of electrolytes in that product. Needless to say, coupling the Body Armor with water, I recovered actually quite quickly uh, from that stomach flu. So another fantastic product, big bet for Coca-Cola. And then one of the most exciting products that I like is Fairlife, right? So Fairlife is our milk business, 
right? This has been growing like gangbusters, double digit percentages, even to the point that our manufacturing facilities, we can't manufacture any more product. We are 100% at capacity. That's the demand of the Fairlife brand. And if I look at that bottle, the third one to the right, the, the small brown one, that's our Fairlife nutrition plan. We only sell it to the big box stores. You can find that at Costco, Sam's, BJ's. But that product in 2023, surpassed the red can as the number one Coca-Cola selling SKU in, in Costco. Unbelievable demand, again, unheard of as well. The red can led uh, <clears throat> those statistics, but this is the first time another brand uh, took, took control, took the number one spot. And then the fifth big bet for the Coca-Cola is Monster. So many of you may be familiar with the various energy drinks out there. You go down the energy aisle, there's tons of them. There's Celsius. There's Prime. Obviously, Monster has been around the longest, but that's an area that we need to really strengthen our strategic relationship with Monster and how do we better market Monster product uh, to our consumer base. But in addition to the beverages, what I really find interesting about Coca-Cola is the innovation, right? Is when we look at our products, right? We have different levels of products, different branding strategies, certain premium products. We're toying with mixers. How do we come up with these very technical specialized mixers that you can mix with alcohol all the way down to our core products. So different price points, uh, different products uh, for our various consumers. In addition, look at wellness uh, and recharging for individuals, the body, right? So it's not just about sparkling. It's not just about Coca-Cola, but how do we go out there and create a brand that's healthy uh, as an example? So smart water, pH balanced water, alkaline water, you know, drinks with a purpose. For example, the body armor as well, drinking that flash IV. That was a purpose for me drinking that body armor. It was for recovery, uh, as an example. And what's also interesting from a digital perspective is how do we better interact with our customers as well? Via cell phone, via apps, being able to create your own drinks online, going up to a freestyle machine, scanning. So these are all different innovations within the company, heavily focused on, okay, how do we capture some of the younger minds? How do we capture the, these quick trends? How do we broaden our beverage base uh, portfolio as well? And not necessarily stick 100% to that red can and explore these other areas, which has been a significant contribution to our growth, as well as our success rate of these new product launches. So that goes to our refresh the world. But now what about making a difference as well? And this is where, where I truly get passionate about making a difference. We don't advertise this. You won't see it on the TV. You won't see it in commercials. But this is what I'm truly proud of. And it wasn't until I actually went into Coca-Cola and started working for Coca-Cola that I realized how much they actually contributed uh, to society above and beyond just to the bottom line. So we have, for example, the Coca-Cola Scholars Foundation. The Coca-Cola Scholars Foundation in the past three decades has donated over $80 million in scholarships to high school students. The Coca-Cola Foundation has awarded over $1.5 billion in grants since its inception in 1984, doing various programs, various initiatives, for example, providing sustainable access to safe water, advancing water resource management, supporting education, workforce development, and inclusion for those dis disadvantaged, right? providing relief, one thing, being in supply chain, being in logistics, anytime there's a tornado, anytime there's a hurricane, you know, we get the phone call, Mike, can you find a trucker to drive in there so we can deliver pallets of water to those that need it most? <clears throat> Think about also Jackson, Mississippi. I don't know if you remember in the news, Jackson, Mississippi had a water crisis, right? What did we do? That's exactly what we did is we put pallets in trucks and we sent them to Jackson, Mississippi for the people. So it's, it's these different things that, that, from a supply chain perspective, I see, I get engaged in, I can support those community and make that difference as well. We are so big into partnerships too. So for example, the World Wildlife uh, Foundation, WWF, right? We've been partnering together right, to improve health of fresh water basins and environmental performance throughout the world as well. Looking at our own supply chain, how can we you know, reduce emissions, improve packaging, improve the water resources? We've partnered with the Special Olympics. In fact, we're a co-founder of the Special Olympics since 1968. And we support and we're committed to the Special Olympics, to different social inclusion programs, 
uh, through donations, in-kind support, as well as various awareness initiatives. And then the American Red Cross. We've been partnering with the American Red Cross since 1917, right? together teaming up, teaming up doing blood drives, disaster relief, as I mentioned previously, providing some financial support, beverage donations, as well as all kinds of volunteer work. And then the fourth one up there, the United Nations, was also very interesting that the Coca-Cola company contributes to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, right? Clean water, sanitation, combating climate change, sustainable consumption, and the list goes on. So these are just a snapshot of our partners, but the Coca-Cola company does so much more uh, as well when it comes to making a difference. And the next big piece is actually sustainability. So from a sustainability perspective, right, we have major initiatives when it comes to that, because we are in the forefront of sustainability. I mean, let's face this, 70% of our product comes in a plastic bottle, right? Plastic is found in the ocean. You find it on the beaches, right? We're, you know, tend to be pointed at saying, what are you doing about that? So when I look at these initiatives, right, we have water consumption. Our goal was to be water neutral, which we have been since 2015. We have a goal to have 100% collection of recycled plastics. That means for every bottle that we produce, we want to bring that bottle back in, recycle it, and at least have 50% of that bottle's content in our new packaging all by 2030. Since 2021, we're at what? I think a 61% completion rate. Uh, and we have over 40 markets where 100% uh, of, of our product is in a recycled uh, bottle. We're also committed to reducing sugar. Right, offering various choices, uh, different products and beverages that are either low calorie or no calorie. We're definitely committed to climate change, reducing our greenhouse gases by 25% uh, by 2030. Right? And that's not easy because we can't do that alone. We have to truly rely on our supply chain partners, both upstream and downstream, to sign up to those same commitments in order for us to be successful. And then last but not least is DEI. Right, people and communities building that inclusion. Right, our goal again is to have, for example, 50% women in leadership roles within the company. Right, since 2021, we're almost at 40%. And the reasons why I personally love also working for Coca Cola and making that difference is one, the company has made me a better person uh, as well. And, and this is not necessarily bragging. But what the company has allowed me to do is to travel to various places throughout the world. I've been to Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Singapore, Sydney, Istanbul, all throughout Europe, South America, Sao Paulo, Rio. And what's interesting is the people that I meet, the cultures that I get to experience, the foods that I get to experience as well on these different business trips. And in having that experience knowing that the world is not Atlanta, Georgia, the world is not the United States, and I love this country. But at the same time, having that exposure has increased my EQ, I feel quite considerably. And I, and I crave that interaction from all these different people from all over the world. Number two is the ability to make a difference within my sphere of control. Like I mentioned, I'm accountable. I own the logistics machine, right? I'm able to go in there and make decisions of who I hire, why I hire, giving people the opportunity to step up within my organization. And then the third point, what I really love about Coca-Cola and how I can make a difference is really the leading, the coaching, and the mentoring of the next generation of leaders, giving them that opportunity. Because I remember when I was in my early 20s coming in into meetings and being a whiz in Excel and showing a pivot table and, oh, check this out, PowerPoint. Right? The people in their 50s and 60s back then had no clue. Now I'm finding myself right in that older side of, of my career where these younger generations, they're coming in now with supply chain degrees, as an example. They're coming in knowing Python, they know Power BI, they know data analytics, and they wow me. But it's my job to give them the opportunity to, to take those ideas, take those concepts, put them in a spotlight uh, and showcase and share as well. So I'm gonna pivot a little bit to supply chain. So the Coca-Cola supply chain, very complex. As Gary mentioned, you can find a Coca-Cola in the smallest little kiosk in the highest mountains in the Himalayas in the middle of the desert uh, to the southernmost point of South America to the coldest reaches of the Arctic. Coca-Cola is just about everywhere. 
And it is a very complex supply chain. And honestly, I think if I tried to map out the supply chain uh, on a chart here, I'd have about 30 more slides. So in its simplistic format, it's very simple. The Coca-Cola company, yes, we own uh, the secret formula. We own the innovation, the creation, the marketing of our products, but we also manufacture those concentrates and syrups. Uh, and, and I'm gonna pivot a little bit and, and talk about the, uh, the secret formula as, as Gary asked. So yes, it is, it is a secret. My understanding is that the formula is in a vault in Atlanta, Georgia, right? Nobody really has access to it, but it is there. And when you think about the inbound ingredients that are coming in, right? People who are actually associated with, with purchasing those, those strategic ingredients, they're Coca-Cola for life, right? They're going to be with us forever and ever because we don't want that information, for example, getting out. Those strategic ingredients end up going to two locations in the world. One's in Florida, one's in the UK. They take those ingredients, they mix and match, and I'm simplifying this, but it's a lot more to that. But they, they create, then I'll call it the, the core flavoring of, of our various products. Those then get shipped to 18 different facilities globally uh, throughout the world who then take those natural flavors and then they combine it with other lists of ingredients. And those ingredients, for example, uh, are packaged appropriately in kits. And then those kits are then shipped to our bottling network, you know, those 200 bottlers globally, worldwide, who then get these kits. And it basically says part A, part B, part C, part D, part E, that's it. There's no explanation of what those parts are. But it's up to the bottler then to then take the, the recipe book and say, okay, well, I take part A, I mix it with part B, I mix it for this long, at this temperature, and then once this happens, I got to add part C. And that's the process. But ultimately, once they, the bottler creates the beverage, they mix it in with the water, they put in the CO2, put it in a can, put it in a bottle, and off they go and distribute, right? That's how secret you know, the formula is. There's nothing written down uh, mm -hmm. at all whatsoever, just different parts, different kits, right? And then from a supply chain perspective, what's really interesting is we ship all this stuff around. So we see it, we just don't know what we're shipping uh, as well. <clears throat> Now, going back to, to the Coca-Cola supply chain, so not only do we make the concentrates and the syrup, which by the way, one truckload of concentrate probably valued anywhere between $650,000 to a million dollars worth of product in one container, uh, just to give you the, you know, the concentration uh, of that. But we also manufacture our finished goods, more of the sexier products. So when I talk about the alcohol, when I talk about the fair life, the body armor, we own those brands as a company. We don't necessarily ship that off to, to bottlers, but then, but we have to use the bottlers to distribute those products. So we send that to our bottler, <clears throat> our bottler community, the bottling system. And then they have well over 900 production facilities worldwide to take all of these products and then ultimately distribute it throughout the world with that results in 2.2 billion servings per day. That's a massive amount of, of consumption, 2.2 billion servings. But in the grand scheme of things, if you think about this, this globe has what, 8 billion people on it today? And if the average person, so I'm told, drinks roughly between eight and 10 beverages per day, think about yourself, how many beverages do you drink per day? Right. Eight to 10. Now multiply that eight to 10 by the 8 billion people on this earth. Compare that to the 2.2 billion. A lot of opportunity there. A lot of opportunity to continue growing. So as a $44 billion operating revenue company, could you imagine if we were at 2.5, 3 billion, 3.5 billion, you know, creeping up the percentages slowly, exponentially that will grow our revenues. But at the same time, we're, we're only a you know, flash in the pan when it comes to the amount of consumption on planet Earth uh, in, in terms of a beverage perspective. So this is this is what my organization does from a supply chain perspective, right? Very simply put, what I always tell everybody, what do you do? And I say, well, if it flies, floats, or rolls, we source it and we optimize it, we streamline it. That's our role. So whether it's ground transportation, various types of trucking, you can read that for yourself. I'm not gonna go into all the details, but it's basically all modes of transportation. Same thing with ocean freight, whether we're shipping in brake bulk, whether we're shipping in containers, right? We're needing outside storage, chilled warehousing, dry warehousing. We need 3PLs, custom services, 
this is all within our scope. And what's great about this is it generates a lot of data, right? And with this data, and this is why I go back to those 20 year olds within the organization is I give them this data. And I said, that, that's your palette of paint, right? All of this data. Now, paint a picture. Tell me what this data says on, uh, about our supply chain. And then once you paint that picture, how can we optimize it? Let's, let's challenge ourselves. Let's challenge the status quo of the supply chain. What else can we do to drive efficiency, to drive performance, right? Yes, we can always go in and ask our carriers for a rate reduction because uh, we, we have to generate savings. But at the same time, that can only go so far. And what we've seen with COVID is surges in, in rate, right? There was no savings or rate reductions. It was all about then capacity. It was all about efficiency. Can we get more efficient within the supply chain? And that's what that team does. So while COVID is still fresh in our minds, and I think about the past two to three years, and, and you can read some of those, those headlines there. Uh, going back two, two to three years, but we had, I think, a coup in Myanmar uh, a few years ago, not too long ago. We had geopolitical events, Russia, Ukraine, currently Israel, Palestine. And I'm not going to get political here. I don't have an opinion on that one way or the other. Uh, we've had truck driving short uh, issues, driver shortages. We had weather problems as well, hurricanes. We had polar vortexes. Uh, as an example, we had COVID lockdowns where like, for example, Shenzhen, Shanghai, major port hubs have been on lockdown. All of these disruptions over the past two to three years, right? I mean, it, it's been a, basically a two and a half year sprint for the organization trying to find capacity battling uh, these challenges. But this is, this is the area though that made logistics and supply chain shine. Right before COVID, if there's a silver silver lining uh, uh, of COVID, it has to do with people now know what I do. Right, people now know what supply chain is and how important it is because it physically impacted them when they went to the stores. And what I like to do is to share a little story with you as well on on how COVID impacted us and how we had to pivot and react and not to be cliche, think out of the box as well to find an alternate solution to keep our product. Uh, product on the shelves as well. So as I mentioned, we're not immune to these situations. In fact, every single one of these has impacted my organization, has impacted Coca-Cola supply chain. So this was back May 7th, 2021. I was on the phone you know, late night. It was a Friday night with one of my superstar employees, Alessandra. Alessandra is based out of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And we're brainstorming on what to do. Right? How do we approach this situation? You know, who do we call first? Is this even possible? You know, of course it is, but how do we pull it off? You know, these are just some of the questions we were having and brainstorming again. We got a big problem here. Right? So we're talking and she goes, all right, let me make a few phone calls. Let's touch base in about an hour. It's a good, good idea. So I hang up the phone with Alessandra and I decided to call one of my newest hires that I just made an offer to, she didn't even start yet. Right? Her start day was May 17th, and this was a Friday night. But I'm calling her anyway, while most people are relaxing you know, from the week, working all week. Ours was just accelerating, unbeknownst to us. So I described the situation to Maria, and then she had a great idea that Alessandra and I didn't even think about. She was, you know, instead of shipping the traditional way uh, in containers with traditional freight forwarders, how about taking a project logistics approach uh, as well? Call the project logistics forwarders. And right then and there, Maria earned her first month's paycheck and then some she didn't even start yet. Right? But so as we started thinking about it, that's that's not bad, right? That that makes sense. And, <clears throat> and but the, the situation we were in and why we're in that situation was really what happened earlier that day. So earlier that day, I got a phone call from Juan one of my business partners in North America, he goes, Mike, uh, our U.S. suppliers are out of stock of this key ingredient. So, okay. Well, Mike, good news is we found sources of supply in China. And however, Chinese source of supply doesn't want any responsibility shipping it. Again, this is the height of COVID, supply chain issues, can't get capacity whatsoever. I said, Okay. Uh, he goes, yeah, we need 500 tons of this key ingredient by Memorial Day. Again, this was May 7th. 
and we needed it by May 28th. I'm like, all right, three weeks, not bad. 500 tons. So yes, I was like, what happens if we don't get this 500 tons in the United States? He goes, well, U.S. production shuts down. I'm like, what production shuts down? U.S. So this key ingredient can be found on over 90% of our products. I said, okay, this is a big deal. This is this went straight to the top, and we have three weeks to do this. So as I continue talking with Juan, he goes, oh, by the way, in addition to that 500 tons, we need an additional 1,500 tons to be delivered by the end of the year. I'm like, okay, 1,500 tons. That's 75 containers worth of product over seven months, right? Where at this time, ocean freight carriers were asking for a minimum three month advance booking notice, if not four or five months. And to get capacity, there was no capacity. They were charging an arm and a leg. So this is where we sprang into action, right? Working all weekend, following up with, with, with our partners, following up with Alessandra. Maria's already working, she hasn't even started yet. And what we ended up doing was actually reaching out to our strategic partners in the supply chain, people that we knew and we could trust and count on saying, hey, we have a problem here, right? How can we get 500 tons of this key ingredient from China to the United States? On top of that, calling the project logistics forwarder from my previous company when I worked at Siemens, called them up. I said, hey, we have a problem. We need 1,500 tons over the next seven months. We don't have capacity. What can you do uh, for us? So <clears throat> working with them, you know, the project logistics team, they ended up then shipping all of this product on project cargo vessels, right? So instead of arriving in the United States in your traditional ports like LAX, New York, Savannah, our product was coming into Mobile, Alabama of all places. Uh, but the important thing is we got the capacity and we got the right partner to do it. And in terms of that first 500 tons, all of that had to go air freight, right? So with one of our partners, they were able to actually secure a handful of aircraft that we put 100% of our product on that aircraft. I think each aircraft was well over a million dollars just to fly that product from China to the United States. So they were able to handle about 250 tons of that product. Whereas our other partner had a different strategy, different plan uh, as well. And this is how we diversified the risk a little bit here. Didn't give all 500 tons just to one of our partners. They ended up shipping the other 250 tons of product in passenger planes, in the belly of passenger planes. One ton here, three ton there, five ton there, all adding up to 250 tons. So in that three week period, if you were traveling on a Delta flight, American Airlines, Korean Air, you name it, chances are we had our product on those flights. Not only going from China to the United States, but also various <clears throat> transition points, transfer points. We had some of it on Lufthansa, an example, going into Germany, getting transferred from Germany on another flight to the United States. So it was truly a coordinated effort. But the most important thing is that our production didn't miss a beat. We delivered the product, right? Production continued. And then as that airplane, all the 500 tons delivered before Memorial Day weekend, that next month in June, the first shipments of that next 1,500 tons started delivering from there throughout December. Right? A truly a team effort, and it really was through partnerships and relationships that made that happen. So some key takeaways when I look at Coca-Cola and, and what I've shared with you a little bit about my own story about Coca-Cola products, making a difference in our supply chain. One, yeah, our business is built on a clear purpose, to refresh the world and to make a difference. We are beverages for life. We are a total beverage company. We're more than just soda, right? We are the, the coffee, the teas, the energy drinks, right? Getting into that alcohol space. People are at the center of what we do. Uh, absolutely. I, I love the team. I love the people I work with. It's such a fun environment, fun culture uh, as well. Each of us can make a big difference for a better shared future. I, I look at my own team uh, as an example. We are 43%. Women on our team, 57% men. We're across five different continents. If I remember correctly, we speak a total of, I thought I wrote it down, but 13 different languages throughout the team. We're based in Sao Paulo, in Europe, Africa, uh, Asia. I mean, it's truly a fantastic team. And, and, and the fact that that's within my sphere of control, this is how I can make a difference, giving those different people a shot and an opportunity to be leaders within the company, right? 
Another key takeaway, leveraging the partnerships, right? As you start your careers and you grow in your careers and you meet people, right? Maintain those relationships, maintain those partnerships because you never know when you're going to need to call them and say, I need help. Or they may want to call you, can you help me, right? It goes a long way. Pay it forward is really the message there. Other part is challenges present opportunities. Never let a good crisis go to waste. And I mentioned how COVID's silver lining was it did it put a spotlight on supply chain and people know what we do. When I started five years ago with the Coca-Cola company and, and, and my boss hired me, he goes, Mike, the reason I'm here is to build out the indirect materials organization of which logistics is one of them. Believe it or not, Coca-Cola didn't have a centralized logistics organization six years ago. It's non-existent. Coca-Cola historically is a very decentralized uh, organization, right? Business units were doing their own thing. Operating units, many facilities were doing this own thing. So it still worked. The supply chain worked, but it wasn't leveraged. And it wasn't until five years ago that it was just four of us said, okay, how do we start looking at this behemoth, which is the Coca-Cola supply chain, and start centralizing it, right? Again, fast forward five and a half years later, I'm standing here with 19 people in my organization, and the company quickly realized how important supply chain is, how important logistics is, how important those relationships and partnerships are in order to be able to get our product you know, to our end customers uh, as well. Uh, you know how they say, you know, have a Coke with a smile? Well, if supply chain wasn't there during COVID, there was nobody smiling uh, as well. And the last little bit is challenge the status quo. Right? Don't, don't be scared to ask questions. Ask questions, go in there. Uh, uh, as well, and think about how can we do this better? What else can we do uh, uh, <clears throat> within the supply chain, within your sphere of control, right? Raise your hand, throw out ideas, and it's the best way to go. So that being said, that's a little bit about the Coca-Cola company, refreshing the world, making a difference. And again, I thank you for being here. Uh, great opportunity. Thank you for the award. Proud to be a Coca-Cola employee. And then I'll open up for any comments, questions, thoughts, uh, to the audience. Any questions? Hello. Um, uh, you explained that Coca-Cola has a strong presence around the world, and in particular, Bangladesh has a co corporate office and a fa uh, factory in Camilla. Uh, Bangladesh also benefited from the Chinese Beltway Initiative by developing the Padna Bridge. So my question is, how does the bridge benefit the Coca-Cola company in terms of infrastructure development? <laughs> Start with yeah. an easy one. No, that, no, that's, <laughs> that's a very easy one. I'll be quite honest with you. I don't know the answer to that. However, I can tell you from a supply chain perspective, when it comes to, to partnering with govern, governments, right, to, to build things and to make investments. Yes, it is for our benefit from a transportation supply chain perspective, right? But at the same time, it also benefits the local community. Not only does it create the jobs to, to build a bridge or build an effort uh, as an example, but at the same time, it, it just benefits the whole community. Um, so although I don't know the, the, the answer to that specific question, I can tell you one initiative, for example, in Guatemala, uh, kind of similar where you know, we operate in Guatemala, but at the same time, we noticed that the quality of the drinking water, the quality of the water there wasn't all the greatest. So what do we do in, in order for us to be able to manufacture there and have a presence there? Uh, we would partner with the local government. We would train the local citizens as an example. Okay, how do we better clean the water, putting in the infrastructure there? And oh, by the way, uh, how do we then also do better for the environment? Because the other thing that we found out within there as they were doing a lot of tree cutting, as an example, creating more land for this manufacturing, using trees to, to heat their homes and for, uh, uh, for cooking. And we said, well, wait a minute, let's not do that just yet. Let's introduce different sources of fuel, different sources of supply, right? Let's kind of save the forests. Let's save the water basins. Let's train the locals in terms of water conservation, firefighting. So we started creating this, this, this industry. So these are the different types of projects that when we partner with these different NGOs uh, and these, uh, uh, whether it's the WWF, uh, United Nations, local governments, that's the intent, right? The intent is to better the community. So again, don't know the specific answer, but using that as an example, I would venture this, it's more or less the same. It's to our benefit, but it benefits the community. 
Other questions? There's a question up there, Julie. <clears throat> So you briefly mentioned reducing emissions. I'm wondering if Coca-Cola is investing in any EV partnerships or different fuel sources for air freight or ships and shipping. Uh, uh, great question. So absolutely. And, and what's interesting is when I first joined Coca-Cola, and, and it still is to agree, we're a conservative company. And traditionally, and this is not a knock, but they would it kind of ne not necessarily led they would follow and at least within the logistics space and, and challenging our supply partners is we want to be the guinea pig we want to be the guinea pig for ev we want to be the guinea pig for av we want to try different ideas concepts you know come talk to me this is what i tell the different ceos of the companies that we work with within the supply chain so in this case for example we're working with uh uber uh, Uber Freight, as an example, doing uh, AV vehicles uh, within the state of Houston, just trialing it out. Uh, there's another company that we're starting to talk with, Wabi, as an example. I had a chance to meet their CEO at, at, at an Uber event, saying, okay, how do we do this? I had another supply partner call me up and say, hey, Mike, we have two EV trucks in, in SoCal. You know, can we get, you know, how do, how do we make this happen? So we are having those conversations, um, saying, where can we trial it? both EV and AV. And it's a slow process, there's no doubt, uh, but it's one that we're making steps within at least my sphere of control. And I go back to, to changing the machine, right, is, is that that's my control. I can make those decisions, says, yes, I wanna try that, right? Legacy Coca-Cola, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But that mindset of change and trying to be now the leaders in the space, oh, it's absolutely there, which I love. Another thing is alternative fuel. Yes, like for example, in the ocean industry, one of the big pollutants in transportation, but we are working with those ocean freight carriers of how do we, you know, how can we ship via LNG or biodiesel uh, as an example. Uh, we also have a partner today where, interesting fact, and I'm gonna go back to answering that. So Puerto Rico, right? So Puerto Rico manufactures to concentrate for the entire United States. Uh, they produce over 97% of, when I say concentrate, your Coca-Cola, Diet Coke, Sprite, Fanta, Fresca is all in Puerto Rico uh, as well. So whether if you're in Seattle, you're up here in Syracuse, you're in San Diego, that concentrate came from Puerto Rico. <clears throat> and that supply chain is very big for us between Jacksonville and Puerto Rico. And today we ship everything 100% on liquid natural gas in that trade lane, which is super. So significantly reducing, but we're not stopping there. So now we're actually went further down into the supply chain. We're talking with the manufacturers of natural gas and really now looking at renewable natural gas, right? There's a lot of cows up here. There's a lot of cows in Michigan, as an example, a lot of wastewater. How can we take advantage of that, create RNG, and then start replacing LNG with RNG to really become net zero? So those are just some of the projects that we're working on, at least within my sphere of control as well. Good question. Question? Hello. Uh, you mentioned that uh, currently your products, uh, you know, emit like 70% in plastic uh, bottles and containers. And you mentioned that you plan to 100% uh, recycle by 2030 and use 50% of the plastic that is utilized before. How uh, Can you share how is Coca-Cola planning to do so to reduce plastic or to recycle by 2030? It's... So, I mean, in, in terms of plastic, it, it's not going to go away. Uh, I mean, I think that's reality because even if you look at, for example, aluminum, you can, you can buy our products in aluminum, but there's not a, enough aluminum manufacturing out there in the world if we were to convert 70% of our products, for example, into aluminum. That's not a solution, right? If you think about glass, same thing. You know, during during COVID, there was a supply chain shortage in glass. There's not enough glass manufacturers in order to put our stuff in glass. Even if you combine aluminum and glass, it's not going to happen. So so plastic is is inevitable. All right, but it's it's making those efforts 
right? And working with recyclers, working with upstream, downstream, right? And understanding again, how do we, how do we take all of this plastic, right? And, and how do we work with it and everything from light weighting as an example. So how can we use less plastic and make it still more durable to hold our beverages, right? It's why you, when you start looking at water, like over here, one of our competitors' waters, the caps keep getting thinner and thinner and thinner, right? Yes, it saves money, but it's also a sustainability play. How do we continue using less, less plastic, right? But these initiatives then, again, it's, it's as we work with them and we start looking at recycling plastics, it's then working with engineering to making sure that these recycled plastics can also withstand the durability uh, of uh, and hold our product uh, in a safe manner so there's no, uh, no issues with the bottle from crushing and, and, and whatnot. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, it's something that this company, again, when it comes to, to plastics and recycling, we want to be on that leading edge and, and really truly leading the way and becoming, you know, 100% uh, content uh, or as much as at least 50% recycled content, 100% returnable. So for every bottle that we produce, we want to be able to bring one back in a recycled format. So be, so be neutral in terms of our manufacturing. Another question. Hi, I have a couple questions. Um, so hello, thank you so much for talking. My name is Claire. Um, and I had a, a qu question about that sustainability uh, on the pa plastic packaging. I'm sorry, I missed that slide. Um, would it be possible for you actually to tap back to it? Sure. Um, so for the um, for the recycling of the plastic, um, are you familiar with the pant, um, pant system in, in, the, in uh, Denmark and Sweden and Finland? Maybe not Finland. But, I am not. Um, they have a Dansk return system. And so everything, all the plastic uh, packaging that actually anything, anything in plastic bottles in Denmark will be recycled through this. It's really interesting. It's a government organization that's a nonprofit, but then it's also, it, it, it's a for-profit, but then it's government organized. It's, so it's very confusing. Sorry, it's for-profit. But um, they basically recycle all of it. And I got to visit the, the their... Um, their place and I, I learned about how they always have to have some virgin material of plastic um, to keep that quality of plastic um, at the, the same amount for for consumers and so that's kind of what you're talking about so I don't really understand how you can you can achieve 100% recyclability of your plastic packaging um, and then I also am familiar with aluminum and I'm wondering why you kind of strayed away from aluminum even though it's one of the most um, uh, universally um, indefinitely recyclable products um, and it's also very light and then I'll let you answer that before I have my next one. So when it comes to aluminum, uh, I think it would be great if marketing was up here to answer that <laughs> uh, as well. But no, I, I, aluminum is a great product. I mean, I'm a fan of aluminum because it, it, it's 99.99999% recyclable, right? maybe with the exception of the ink that gets burned off uh, as an example. Right? But the, the thing about aluminum, again, is there's just not enough manufacturing. Uh, for that. That's number one. Right? If we could, I think that we would shift a lot more towards aluminum, if at all possible. Number two is that it's also our consumers. Our consumers also like the ability to, to close right? and, and, and save their product for a later time. So they're not forced to drink 100% of the beverage, because once you crack an aluminum can, yeah, I mean, we are experimenting with different tops, different closures that we have. We actually, if you go to other parts of the world, we actually have Coca-Cola products that, that you can actually slide and close an aluminum can. So, so we do have that, right? But different countries within our system are at different stages of sustainability. I would say that the Europeans do tend to lead the way when it comes to sustainability, and a lot of that is government-driven. Right? But when it comes to, for example, the United States and what we see here, there isn't necessarily that governmental push yet. Uh, I would say that when I when I look at and I think about sustainability, now this is my own personal perspective, is that as Europe leads the way, following Europe, then tends to be California, and then California tends to lead the way in the United States, and the rest of the states follow, and then Texas and Florida, right? <laughs> Nothing against Texas and Florida. Uh, but that that's typically what we're, we're what we're seeing uh, as well. So it all really depends on the you know governments, their investments, how much they drive consumer choice, consumer preference, availability of goods in the supply chain. So it's a slew of reasons why or why not we could be or shouldn't be uh, in plastics and or aluminum. 
Um, and then my other, another, another question I have is uh, the challenge. She said, never let a challenge go to waste. I was wondering the 500 tons, how do you guys not see that key ingredient was needed um, at the end of May prior to early May? Excellent question. I asked that same thing of the people who are responsible for buying that key ingredient <laughs> as well, because usually logistics is the last to know uh, as well. Um, I, I, Honestly, I, I don't know the reason why. It was just one of those, the, and this has happened. There's so many examples of this, but the buyers, I think they may be just embarrassed to speak up, to be quite frank with you, saying, we have a problem. And they waited till the last minute to say, we have a problem, mm -hmm. right? We had one example, I'll never forget this either, uh, nitrogen, right? So during the peak of COVID, right, we use nitrogen to actually, uh, two reasons. One, we use nitrogen to help push our product through the pipes, but we also drop nitrogen in, in water, like Dasani water or our stills product. The nitrogen drop in that product doesn't impact the product, but what it does, it gives the bottle stability, right? So it's a gas pushing out on the bottle. Because you ever notice when you open up a, a water bottle, it collapses, mm -hmm. right? That's the it's a, it's a drop of nitrogen. So <clears throat> same thing. It was actually a Friday night. I get a phone call. Hey, our supplier for gas called a force majeure. Okay, when did it call the force majeure? August 11th. I'm like, today's the 16th. Why are we just finding out about it now? It's like, yeah, if we don't get a tanker of nitrogen to our facility by late Sunday, Monday morning, we're shutting down. And oh, by the way, uh, this facility generates seven figure revenues on a daily basis for us. Mike, so maybe explain what force, force majeure is for people who don't know. Ah, so uh, force majeure is that the, the acts of God governments, war, companies can't do business, so they're no longer liable to supply your products uh, in, in a nutshell. But this force majeure was because they directed all of their cryogenic tankers to deliver oxygen to hospitals. It's like, okay, no, that's very important. We don't want to take tankers away from, from hospitals uh, as well, but what do we do? Right? So again, it's, could we have foreseen this? Maybe, maybe not. And I go back to preparedness uh, and business continuity. You, it's very difficult to, to prepare for any one particular event. Mm -hmm. right? what, what you can do is, is prepare for situations, right? What if this plant goes down? Where's the backup plant? Or where's the backup ingredients? Do I have secondary of, uh, sources of supply, right? So a lot of this was also a learning experience because prior to COVID, you know, think, things were burning, running quite well, to be quite frank with you. So some of this stuff wasn't predictable, but we had to react and we had the processes in place to be able to react quickly and continue delivering. That's why you still continue to see Coca-Cola products on the shelves. Thank you. I'm um, sorry. One last question. Um, well, more of a, this is not a question so much as that. Please um, push out more education about emptying out the Coca-Cola plastic bottles um, to release and liberate the water. Thank you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. more comments questions i'll ask students, one staff. this is nothing i'll ask maybe you explain you mentioned earlier mike about this new kind of a i said mike a marketing kind of strategy that ultimately affects the supply chain where they're releasing these limited flavors and the and the strategy behind that uh, no uh, great question so we have coca-cola creations uh it's a new way of introducing products in short, I call it blips. Again, I'm, I'm not a marketing major, so I'll try to describe it as best as possible. Uh, but it started with a starlight product, supposed to taste like the stars, right? And then there was Coca-Cola marshmallow, not flavor, but it was, uh, the, I think it was a DJ uh, artist, musician named Marshmallow. So it was based on his style of music. And it was Coca-Cola bite, which is supposed to take a taste electronic, Coca-Cola ultimate uh, experience points. So it's like it was a gaming flavor. And it's, these are these ins and outs of products. So, so the company is taking the core Coca-Cola formula and adding different flavors, different trends, different tastes as well, and putting it out to the public, right? Some people love it. Some people hate it, right? But the strategy behind that is, is not so much to have a, a sustained product, or maybe it does come back. Maybe it's like the McRib, right? It just comes and goes every once in a while. <laughs> But yeah, yet to be seen, because again, it's out of my pay range and out of my scope of work. But what, what our CEO, when we asked him, you know, what, why aren't we keeping these products around? And it's just that they're, they're not meant necessarily to, to be these new growth products. 
But one, it gets people curious, right? It goes after, honestly, your generation as well, who has the cell phones and, and, and you know, click, 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 what's new, what's not, right? So that's what we're trying to do is when we market, it's like, try this product. Okay, take it away. Next product, take it away. Next product, take it away. But what that also does is it, it keeps people's minds fresh on the core original Coca-Cola product. So yeah, they may try Coca-Cola Dream World, Coca-Cola Ultimate, YK3000, I think is another product. But then they go, you know what? I, I do really like the original flavor. I'm going to go back to the original flavor and buy one of those as well. Question. Great. Thanks. Any other questions for Mike? You can yes, one over there. And as the microphone goes over there, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Feel free to say, here's who I am. Saw you at Syracuse. Um, I was wondering, you, you gave a specific example where you utilize global partners. I've read a little bit about COVID's effect in deglobalizing the supply chain. Um, do you think that'll be an enduring thing? Um, companies will deglobalize and, and leverage suppliers that are in the U.S., or do you think it'll go back to a global model? My personal opinion will be a balance. Right? But I think prior to COVID, the world was pretty comfortable sourcing a lot from, from Asia, from China. And COVID said, it really taught companies a bit of a lesson as well, saying don't put all your eggs in one basket or in one region. I can tell you from a Coca-Cola perspective, we've also uh, changed our sources of supply as well from where we buy certain key strategic ingredients. Some ingredients that where we were single source, not necessarily sole source, but single source is like, okay, no, no, we need a dual source strategy. We need to, to near shore as an example, all of that play, plays a role uh, as well. Other companies have done the same thing as well. Do I see, you know, maybe the pendulum swung, but somewhere there has to be a middle ground. And my personal opinion is any company in their supply chain should have a balance of both, right? I mean, if you want to be greedy and go 100% in Asia, again, this is my own personal opinion, opinion not a company opinion, uh, and go there, you know, high risk, high reward. But the next time, hopefully there's not a next time of a pandemic, but as you know, with supply chain and transportation, something will happen. There will be a next time. And then are you prepared? Do you have that a resilient supply chain, at least a resilient strategy, a dual source strategy, get ingredients anywhere? But it's a fine balance uh, as well. Good. So we have about five minutes until the class break. So if you can, please just sit tight um, and, uh, and then we'll have a class break. So we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Hi, my name is Lauren Perry. I actually have the privilege of going Hello. to the head Coca nice I have the privilege of going to the yes, um, Coca-Cola headquarters um, over the summer. And I got to learn a little bit about your guys' supply chain. So I just wanted to ask you, um, as bottlers kind of conglomerate, how does Coca-Cola go about um, kind of leveraging those partnerships and kind of keeping those deals in tow? Absolutely. So when, when it comes to, to, to the bottlers, I mean, they're, they, are, they are their own independent companies, right? They have a contract with the Coca-Cola company. Uh, and in fact, the, the, I would, in my own personal opinion, but the bigger the bottler, the easier it is to deal with it because then they have those advanced processes. They have uh, uh, the, the technical capabilities. They have the systems where we can connect. Right, so we as a company can connect into their inventories, into their systems. They can share data back with us to make sure that we have the appropriate inventories, the right orders in place. It makes it actually much easier uh, to deal with them in terms of from a distribution perspective, or at least from a supply chain perspective, uh, uh, as well. But at the same time, too, right, we have to rely on our bottlers also to do a good job, to do the right thing, right. So in all of our agreements, if a bottler doesn't do a good job or they're struggling. Right. We reserve the right to then to take ownership of that. And we'll put that in our bottling investment group, also called BIG or BIG. Right? So BIG, we actually own a set of uh, manufacturing facilities as well. But the whole intent of, of that organization is to bring bottlers in, fix them, refranchise. Or if we're in an emerging market, for example, uh, like India, all of India, Indonesia, the Philippines, that's all bottler investment group because we're seeing double digit growth. So we really, really want to control that, but then ultimately still refranchise that out to the system, right? Our bread and butter, our core goes back to this slide here, right? Our core competency is this. We own the formula, we own the concentrate, we innovate, create, and market. 
right? When it comes to supply chain and distribution, you know, printing those CDs, making those thousands and thousands uh, of, of Coke bottles and cans, that's up to the bottlers. And, that, and we have to rely on that, those partners worldwide uh, in order to distribute our product. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> One more question. I have Comment? a question. Um, yes. How many of the countries around the world are your new trial um, products coming out in? Are you that you're trying to bring back to Coca? A cola. You know, that's a good question. And I don't know the answer to that. I know it's very big in the United States, but I haven't seen necessarily those brands in some of the other countries I visit. But a lot of it also has to do with, I think, the consumer base uh, within, within those countries. I will say that same concept, though, does work in Japan, right? And especially on our stills and our coffee products. In Japan, we're, we're launching um, quite a few products every single year, and these are just blips. So it does work in certain geographies, exactly which ones and how much, I, I, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, okay, well. and I assume Europe is not considered a geography. Correct. <laughs> it says individual countries. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we're going. Let's at this point we're going to take a short break. We're going to start back up at three thirty. We want to thank Mike Kulikowski from Coca-Cola. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Good afternoon. We're going to begin the second half of our program. And we're going to start off with a student presentation, uh, an interesting supply chain problem that deals with the citrus industry, impacts Coca-Cola directly. This is a problem that um, Coca-Cola is dealing with. And our student presenters today are Lauren Perry, Adele Bay Smith, Ryan Shinushi, and Thomas Wagner. Good afternoon, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking about citrus screening and its impact on the citrus supply chain. This will be our agenda for today. We're going to go over the citrus industry. Then we're going to talk about what is citrus screening and then the industry impact and response, preventative measures, alternative risk, and then what can supply chain managers do now? The citrus industry is a huge industry with a global market value of $7.6 billion. This number is expected to grow in the upcoming years with an annual growth of 4.1% until 2030. However, what are citrus fruits? Oranges are the most popular citrus fruits accounting for 58% of global production. Lemons and limes follow with 15% of production. Clementines and mandarins follow with 13% and grapefruits follow with 7%. However, these are just a few citrus fruits as there actually exists over 1000 different varieties of fruits in the whole world. These fruits are grown in over 140 countries. However, I wanna bring attention to the United States, Mexico, Brazil, and China, which are the top leading producers of oranges across the globe. Now let's pivot into the juice industry. The juice industry is heavily reliant on citrus fruits. The market value is $147.5 billion. And this number is also expected to grow in the upcoming years with an annual growth of 4.29% until 2028. The top leaders in the market are Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, and Wild Flavors, and the most popular juice worldwide is orange juice, accounting for 30% of the revenue worldwide, showing the importance of just oranges. So which, with such a large juice industry, it's important for us to squeeze the most out of our oranges. During the manufacturing process, the orange is separated into two separate parts, the pulp and the peel. So the pulp is first separated with, from the peel and later to be sold to use in juice beverages, or in juice products. The peel is, or oils are extracted from the peel, and this allows beverage manufacturers to um, put the flavors in their beverages. While extracting the oils, comp beverage companies are able to boil the orange flavor extract down into a concentrated syrup that allows them to save costs on transportation. Another commonly used byproduct is citric acid, but due to increased costs, companies are looking for alternative methods of deriving a synthetic citric acid due, uh, from a fermentation process of corn. This not only helps us save costs, but also allows us to maximize the full use of the orange in our juice and beverage products. So in these Coca-Cola subsidiaries, like Simply and Minute Maid, they utilize the juice pulp in their products, in their juices. And companies like Sprite and Fanta use the citrus oil extract to flavor their beverages. Despite the prominence of these beverage and juice products, 
companies, U.S. orange production has been on the decline since 2000. Now that we understand the prevalence of citrus in both the juice and beverage industry, we need to understand the increasing threat to the citrus supply chain, citrus screening. Citrus screening is a disease affecting all commonly known varieties of citrus, and its original name is Guanlong Bing as it originated in Asia alongside most varieties of citrus, such as oranges. This name roughly translates to yellow shoot disease or yellow dragon disease because of the characteristic yellow shoots caused by the disease. Citrus screening is caused by a bacterium, commonly known as the HLB bacterium, which is spread by insects, the most common of which is the Asian citrus psyllid. The Asian citrus psyllid becomes infected by feeding on an infected citrus plant and taking the bacteria into its system, and then spreads it to healthy plants once the bacteria is present in the system by feeding on them. Not only does citrus screening cause tree shoots to yellow, it also causes twig dieback, molting, and reduced fruit size and quality. And because the disease affects the tree and its systems, this means fruits do not color properly, leading to the Western name greening. Even if fruits do reach some level of maturity, they still have a bitter taste as opposed to the tart taste that we've all become familiar with. And in areas where the disease is endemic, citrus trees may only live five to eight years and never bear usable fruit. And there's currently no known cure to citrus screening. Even though citrus screening originated in Asia with an increasingly integrated global supply chain, it was only a matter of time before it found its way to the US. And there are two possible sources for citrus screening's introduction to the United States. The first of which is that it was introduced directly through Asian imports. This is because between 1985 and 2003, there was over 170 recorded inceptions of live Asian citrus psyllids at U.S. ports and numerous other records of infected citrus fruits. The second theory is that it, it migrated naturally from South America. This is because the Asian citrus psyllid has been present in South America, specifically Brazil, since 1942, and over time could have naturally populated and migrated through Central America and the Caribbean before finding its home along the southern United States border. Currently, the HLB bacterium is found in states along the southern border, including California, Florida. However, the insect itself, the Asian citrus psyllid, is found in numerous other states, including Alabama, Arizona, and Hawaii, to name a few. This is because with increasing global temperatures caused by global warming, the insect is finding homes in more states, and the bacterium is likely to follow. As you can see in California alone, from 2013 to 2020, the area affected by the Asian citrus psyllid has more than quadrupled. With the spread of citrus screening and the Asian citrus psyllid, the domestic citrus industry has been detrimentally impacted as scientists race to find a cure to the HLB bacteria. And this has made it increasingly difficult for supply chain managers in both beverage and juice companies to find viable sources of citrus. So according to the USDA's 2022 citrus fruit summary, the state of Florida comprised 36% of the domestic citrus production, the state of California made up 62%. In the year 2002, Florida's total utilized citrus production was 16.4 million tons. This figure has declined by five to six million tons in both subsequent decades. This has had a phenomenally negative impact on the Floridian citrus economy. Since the discovery of HLB in Florida in 2005, 80% of packing houses and processing plants in the citrus industry have closed, and Florida has lost over 60% of their citrus-bearing acreage. According to a study from the University of Florida, the 2001 bearing acreage for citrus fruit has declined from 750,000 acres in 2001 to a little under 370,000 acres in 2022. The relatively stable production in California has somewhat offset this dramatic decline in production. So what can be done? As mentioned previously, there is no cure for HLB. However, a number of preventative measures could be implemented to contain the risk posed by this disease should be noted that no preventative measure is 100% effective and that each measure has its own unique benefits and drawbacks. In highly industrialized farms, such as those present in Brazil, the use of heavy industrial machinery helps to separate and physically remove and destroy the infected HLB citrus trees 
from the rest of the non-infected plants on the properties. Unfortunately, in Florida, where farms are smaller and more independently owned, such a countermeasure is impractical. Pesticides are also widely used. However, they are dangerous. Historically, their use has been linked to cancer, which is why in some economic zones, such as the European Union, their use is disallowed. Antibiotics are, while highly effective in actually killing off the HLB virus, are also highly effective in damaging a tree's immune system, thereby damaging its future ability to ward off bacterial infections. A more novel solution known as chemical indu immune inducers is essentially a supplement, a synthetic compound that helps to help that helps to increase a tree's immune response to novel viruses. However, this is not yet marketized or commercialized and is not really seen in use regularly in the citrus industry. Finally, another more novel solution is genetic modification. So the University of California in the past five years has actually been experimenting with genetic modification for the purpose of fighting off HLB. And they even found that in a certain breed of sweet oranges, several strands of DNA exist that are completely immune to HLB for over five years. Of course, this is highly experimental and there is a rather protracted timeline associated with its implementation. So because of the HLB and the, also the impact of recent ecological disasters, the supply of citrus product in the United States has gone down. So since 2020, the result of this is that since 2020, orange juice futures have increased by 350% on the commodities market. In addition to this, there has been a 270% increase in the price of orange juice at the grocery store in the same time period. So consumers are paying more for orange juice and other citrus products, while producers and manufacturers have to increase the prices just to maintain operating margins. <clears throat> So supply chain managers are now looking for alternative sources of orange juice and other citrus products internationally. Fortunately, in the past 10 to 15 years, the Brazilian supply of citrus product has remained relatively stable, which is why recently American producers have started to import more citrus product from this country. So as domestic production of citrus has been on the decline, juice and beverage companies have started to look outward for their citrus supply. Now the question arises, where can we get the citrus from? Brazil is the country's largest exporter for citrus fruits. Um, and they have three major suppliers who actually own their own vessels to transport juice exclusively to the US, showing the importance of Brazil to the United States. However, there is a presence of HLB in Brazil, but due to these major suppliers who have been able to successfully implement regulations to um, prevent the spread of disease, they have been very successful in controlling disease. On the other hand, Florida, which consists of smaller and more independent farms, were not reactive to the disease, which is why they had a higher spread rate. So as production in Florida has now been decimated because of hurricanes and greening, the amount of product imported has actually grown dramatically over the past few years. So in the early 2000s, the United States used to be a net positive exporter of citrus fruits. However, since 2014, they have now become a net importer of citrus, and this number has been increasing every year. However, there are market risks when trading with Brazil. Some of these include the bad infrastructures, custom processes, and regulatory systems, which may increase the lead times when importing from Brazil. Furthermore, organized crime, the lack of intellectual property protection, and no free trade agreement between Brazil and the United States causes a huge risk to American companies trying to import their products into the country. Lastly, countries should be prepared to face high costs as well as high delays when trying to get their products into the market because of Brazil's complicated tax system. However, Brazil does remain the logical source of citrus due to its proximity to the United States, and this leads to lower transportation costs and lower lead time. So, what, so as supply chain managers, how can we best respond to the impacts of citrus greening on the supply chain? Due to the decrease in domestic supply, supply chain managers have found it increasingly difficult to source a consistent supply. This has forced companies to look outwards in countries like Brazil. 
But since there are a finite number of global suppliers, we need to ensure that we're securing our supply through techniques of um, trade swaps and hedging. And as we source from um, global suppliers, it's important to keep in mind that this magnifies the complexities and costs of the supply chain. With increased costs coming from overseas transportation with duty rates of 4.5 cents per liter, while not only increasing lead times, but also the uncertainty in the supply chain as a whole. Although there is no current cure for citrus greening, there are potential hopes that we need to keep an eye out for. And as supply chain managers, it's important for us to stay updated with the latest rules and developments in disease prevention. Due to the limited supply of oranges and citrus fruits, we need to utilize technological advancements to maximize the full orange, making more products with the same amount of supply. And as we move forward in this uncertain world, Anita Bryant reminds us that breakfast without orange juice is like a day without sunshine. So let's keep shining. Are there any questions? Questions for the team? Uh, yeah. With the uh, citrus screening, is there certain types of citrus that are less affected by it, whether it be limes or uh, certain types of oranges, for example? So this disease actually affects all citrus fruits. So that's why it's such a, such a big, um, such a big issue for the citrus supply chain as a whole. And uh, yeah. For the most part, without genetic modifications, they're not really resistant. And yet, yes, the gen genetic modifications can lead to temporary resistance. Like in the study by the University of California, it lasted for about five years, but currently there's no specific kind of citrus that's particularly immune that is also used by juice and beverage companies widely. As a yeah, as opposed to the top three that we kind of mentioned, like oranges and limes and grapefruits. Other questions. This is a huge problem, actually, that there's no quick answer for. I know it's got a direct impact on on Mike Kulikowski's job, correct? No, it, it, it absolutely does. I mean, our supply chain has shifted because of that. Uh, I mean, I work with my partner, Jay. So he's, he's the head director of buying citrus, buying oranges. And going into next year, we're really not planning on consuming any oranges from Florida. Uh, yet our plant, our largest plant that supplies 97% of all the Minute Maid and Simply in the United States. So whether you're in Seattle, San Diego, you know, upstate Vermont, upstate New York, uh, chances are it, it came from that plant, but our sources of supply uh, have to come from other parts of the world. Uh, it's been actually a pretty sad situation in Florida uh, to see that just the, the groves get decimated uh, by this disease. And the other interesting thing too, when it comes to juice, uh, demand continues to grow uh, for orange juice uh, and different uh, citrus products as well. Because if you think about COVID, think about the flu getting sick, what do people think of? Vitamin C. What happens or what happened during COVID, right? I mean, we saw juice consumption go through the roof. People drinking more orange juice for health benefits, as well as to ward off, you know, infection, the flu, colds, so on and so forth. So, I mean, this is truly a challenge for, for the Coca-Cola company, there's no doubt. It, it does. Um, uh, it, for the consumer, yes, uh, it will. Uh, but I know as a company, and again, this is probably above my pay grade. Uh, obviously, we, the last thing we want to do is to increase prices on our consumers. But at the same time, it's finding that right balance between cost of our product, but at this uh, uh, and 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 what we sell it for, as an example. But our scientists. And I think you mentioned it in your presentation as well, is how can we extend the life of that orange or extend the usability uh, of that orange as well? So yes, our scientists do work to figure out, okay, can we make those oils last longer? Can we make them go longer? Um, how else can we potentially use less orange and get more, more out of it? So, we're, so we are working um, with our partners, with scientists to do just that. Any other questions for the, the team? If not, thank you very much. So as mentioned before, um, Micron is here today. Uh, 
my crown is a corporation has made a tremendous investment in Syracuse. I mean, Syracuse really uh, won the lottery with Micron. And um, we're very pleased to have Micron beginning to be a partner with Syracuse University. And we're very pleased to, to develop that partnership because there's gonna be a lot of opportunity here in Syracuse for Micron. There's gonna be a lot of opportunity for students here at Syracuse University. Uh, here to talk more about Micron's philosophies, their practices is Darcy Hall. She's the manager of Global Supplier Diversity. Thank you all so much for being here. It's so great um, to hear from you know such amazing student presenters as well as leaders and speakers. Um, so I'm here today representing Micron's Supplier Diversity and Inclusion Program. Uh, which is embedded within Micron's global procurement organization. And we serve as an arm of um, our responsible sourcing efforts, which aim to improve environmental and social conditions throughout our global supply chain. So a quick look at what I'll be covering today. Um, I'll start with a quick video just to ground you in who Micron is, our vision, uh, what we make. Um, I'll provide a brief overview of our company profile, um, our technology portfolio, as well as our global footprint. And then I'll move into our U.S. manufacturing investments with a specific focus on the state of New York. Um, and then from there, I'll really do a deep dive into our supplier diversity and inclusion program, what it is, why we do it, and how. Okay, so Micron is at the heart of some of the world's most transformative technologies, and we are also a company with a heart. So I'm here today to talk to you about how we plan to live our vision and further our values, specifically as we prepare for um, our investment in the state of New York, and most importantly, how we do this through our supplier diversity and inclusion program. So... A bit about Micron as a company. So our company was founded in 1978 in Boise, Idaho, in the basement of a dental lab. Um, since that time, we've been awarded over 54,000 patents, and today we're ranked 136 on the 2023 Fortune 500 list. We're one of the largest semiconductor manufacturers in the world and the only U.S.-based manufacturer of memory and storage solutions. All right, so let's talk about our products. You've heard me say memory and storage solutions several times now, but what does that actually mean? So more simply, semiconductors or chips are the essential working memory of basically every computing device. So our chips are all around us, whether or not you know, you know it, um, we're interacting with them almost constantly. So um, Micron memory, is inside of your cell phones, tablets, and computers. Um, our products enable uh, work collaboration, online learning, gaming. Um, our chips are embedded in industrial applications, like think IoT in smart factories, smart cities, um, machine-to-machine communication, as well as aerospace. 
So Micron also powers the modern car, which are essentially moving virtual data centers these days. Um, so to kind of put this in more relatable terms, anything with a screen requires memory and storage. If you then think about, you know, some of the real-time insights or inferences that we you, that we like rely on every day. So for example, um, earlier today, I was Googling like restaurants near me. We were trying to find lunch. So every time um, we interact with like a real-time insight, um, that requires another factor of memory. And then you add in things like um, whether or not a restaurant is busy, overlaid over that, that requires another layer of memory. Um, and then even beyond that, you know, there are data centers um, and that back all of this up, and that requires another factor of memory. So when you take that in the context of AI, um, the demand for memory and storage is going to skyrocket, and we're already seeing, you know, tremendous growth. Okay, so here's a look at, you know, what our products actually look like. Um, what's always amazing to me is how much space it takes to manufacture something so tiny. It's actually kind of mind blowing. Um, the process to make a chip is also really incredible. And it's arguably perhaps one of the most um, amazing human undertakings ever. So before chips make it into those little rectangles that you see up there, um, they go through this amazing journey where all kinds of materials are deposited and then carved into patterns using plasma and reactive gases um, just to make it into those, those packages that you see today. So it's a truly like mind-blowing process uh, to get to see. Okay, so our global footprint from four people in the basement of a dental lab to a workforce of more than 40,000 team members and counting, which I'll get into more here in a minute. Um, we operate across 17 countries in 11 manufacturing sites and 15 customer labs. And our success is really built on our global footprint and our diverse and talented team. Uh, furthermore, our global footprint really allows us to benefit from scale, streamline processes and operations, and it brings together some of the brightest talent in the world to work on some of our most advanced memory technologies. We also rely on a network of over 8,000 suppliers to build our products and run our fabs, or our operations, excuse me, and this network will continue to grow, um, as will the number of employees uh, with our recently announced uh, investments to expand in the US. Okay, so let's take a look at our two biggest projects, or our two major planned projects. So the first is in Boise, Idaho, um, where Micron is planning to invest approximately 15 billion through the end of the decade. This fab will bring together Micron R&D and manufacturing, which will enhance operational efficiency, accelerate technology deployment, and also improve time to market. The clean, clean room space, which is like the ma manufacturing space, um, will ultimately reach 600,000 square feet, which is the size of approximately 10 football fields, so very large. Um, it'll create 17,000 jobs in Idaho, uh, 2,000 of which approximately will be micron jobs, and 15,000 of which will approximately be community jobs. Okay, so moving on to our project in New York. In Clay, we are planning to invest up to $100 billion over the next 20 plus years to construct a new leading edge fab. The first phase of this investment will be around 20 billion planned by the end of this decade. Um, again, this fab will increase domestic supply of leading, leading edge memory and complement our fab in Boise. This fab will be even larger um, and it will eventually include four 600,000 square feet foot clean rooms um, for a total of 2.4 million square feet, um, which is approximately the size of 40 US football fields. So in the state of New York, this will create um, around 50,000 jobs, including 9,000 micron jobs and approximately 40,000 jobs within the community. So when we talk about community jobs, these are, 
jobs at Micron suppliers, Micron supplier suppliers, and all kinds of you know, businesses on the periphery that provide support services and everything else. So Micron, in addition to that, um, alongside the state of New York is going to be investing um, 500 million in community and workforce development over the duration of the project. Okay, so we've covered Micron profile, our products, we talked about the global manufacturing footprint. So now let's talk about supplier diversity and inclusion. So at Micron, we firmly believe that the success of our business is interconnected with the diversity and inclusivity of our supply chain. So this uh, belief really starts at the top. It's actually one of our six corporate level DEI commitments, all of which have executive ownership. So our supplier diversity commitment is owned by Micron's chief procurement officer, so what does this mean in practice? Um, basically, this translates into goals at the global procurement level and sub goals at the procurement category level. And like I mentioned, our chief procurement officer is ultimately accountable with oversight from our board of directors. So this is a best practice that really ensures the highest level of visibility and support. Okay, so what is supplier diversity and inclusion? Supplier diversity and inclusion is a business strategy to increase representation of diverse suppliers within a business's supply chain. So whereas, you know, DEI, internal DEI programs focus on issues of diversity and equality and inclusion within the internal company workforce, supplier diversity looks at ownership diversity of the businesses and suppliers within the supply chain ecosystem. So at Micron, we are committed to advancing opportunities and building mutually beneficial partnerships with small businesses, businesses that are owned, majority owned by women, uh, members of underrepresented groups, people with diverse abilities, members of the LGBTQ plus community, and veterans. And on the right there, or maybe, yeah, the right, um, you can see the certification standards that Micron aligns to. Okay. So why is supplier diversity and inclusion important to Micron's business? So at Micron, we understand the collective impact that our sourcing decisions have on our business and our communities. So when you think about, you know, the amount of money that Micron spends on sourcing a year, it's significant. So we recognize that it's both the company's responsibility and our partners' shared responsibility to make commitments and business decisions that positively enrich life for all. Um, because it's the right thing to do, yes, but it's also good for our business. So let's talk about why. So inclusive sourcing practices make supplier pools bigger, which increases competition and can drive down costs. It can also reduce the risk of supply chain disruptions by diversifying and multiplying sources, this can help mitigate the effects of natural disasters, geopolitical conflicts, pandemics, um, and other unforeseen events. Small businesses can also offer more flexibility and, and agility when responding to changing market conditions um, and customer demands, and they can often adapt their production and delivery and service faster than a larger firm can. There are also benefits of local and regional sourcing, for example, um, both social and environmental. So environmental can reduce the impact associated with transportation and create economic opportunity and growth in communities through job creation, um, income, and tax revenue. Okay, so here's a look at the progress of Micron Supplier Diversity and Inclusion Program so far. So. Our program has been in place for about three years. Um, when I first started at Micron, which was about four years ago, about a quarter of my time was supposed to be devoted to standing up this program. So when we first um, measured our spending with diverse suppliers, we were doing about 104 million annually. Um, our second year into the program, we more than doubled that. Our third year, we exceeded 450 million in spending with diverse suppliers. And we just recently closed our fiscal year 23, um, but we do expect to exceed our targets there and have again, um, you know, made significant progress as far as our, our spending goes. 
uh, it's also been pretty amazing to just see the evolution of the program and the evolution of the commitment. You know, again, it, the team started as basically me, and now I have a global team that supports execution as well as um, our global procurement teams. So, um, while we've made a lot of progress uh, in a pretty short amount of time, we recognize that there's a lot more work to be done, um, which leads me to our supplier diversity commitments for the mega fab in New York. So we've set some really aggressive targets and made some bold commitments around utilization of small and diverse businesses for this project. So um, for our eligible construction spending, we've committed to a goal of 30% utilization of small and diverse businesses. We've also set a goal for ongoing operations thereafter, um, which is 30% utilization of small and diverse businesses for ongoing eligible operation costs. In addition to that, we've also committed to prioritizing um, local and regional businesses first in our sourcing activities. So when you think about the amount of money that Micron will be spending and just the, the magnitude and scale of this project, I mean, the opportunity is immense. Um, it really is historic and a once in a generation opportunity. And um, Micron is really committed to fostering an ecosystem where small and diverse businesses can grow and thrive. Okay, so we've talked about the why, we've talked about what it means to Micron, so let's look at basically our organization and strategy to achieve this. So I mentioned executive ownership for this commitment. It's owned by our chief procurement officer with oversight by the board of directors. Um, we have a global program team. And in addition to that, we have a global network of supplier diversity champions who are essentially responsible for um, driving awareness, visibility for goals, advocating for diverse suppliers with procurement stakeholders, educating team members, and really just leading by example. So this is a best practice that has proven to be extremely effective, especially in um, driving progress globally. So in fiscal year 22, when we spent about 500 and, or excuse me, 454 million with diverse suppliers globally, around 42% of that was with um, women-owned businesses in Asia. And what's very exciting about that is it is that spending was with uh, suppliers that operate in more technical space. Okay, so let's talk about the program strategy. Um, our strategy focuses on four pillars of impact. The first is our direct impact, which focuses on the sourcing that Micron does directly. So this is otherwise referred to as our tier one spending. This encompasses our end-to-end -end procurement processes and the systems, tools, and policies that enable and govern our work. So examples include database tools to identify diverse businesses, sourcing platforms that are configured to measure inclusion and competitive bid opportunities, and then policies and, and best practices around payment terms, selection criteria, and the decision analysis process and the prioritization of diverse businesses in new sourcing events. So the primary metrics that we use to evaluate success for our direct impact include tier one spending with diverse businesses, and then the rate of inclusion in sourcing events. Okay, the second pillar is indirect impact, which is essentially our tier two plus impact. Um, whereas tier one is Micron's sourcing directly with suppliers, tier two would be our suppliers' suppliers. Um, so as a global leader in the industry, we have significant influence within our larger supply chain ecosystem, which is why we require our suppliers to have their own supplier diversity programs in place. We work with them to set targets. We uh, work with them to build their own capabilities. And we also hold them accountable via performance management processes like supplier scorecards. So in our industry, this is a really important lever um, because it, of course, you know, micro or amplifies Micron's impact, but it also serves to grow supplier diversity in really IP intensive areas. 
So the, the primary metric that we use to evaluate our success in the indirect sphere is our tier two spending with diverse suppliers. Our third and fourth pillars are ecosystem and industry. So to build the ecosystem, we invest in partnerships at the national and local level um, that basically support the growth and success of diverse businesses through great, greater access, training, capacity building, advocacy, networking, that kind of thing. So examples of some of our uh, national partners include the National Minority Supplier Development Council, the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, and the US Black Chamber of Commerce, among others. At the local level in central New York, for example, um, we partner with organizations like Center State CEO, the Upstate Minority Economic Alliance, Southside Innovation Center, who are all helping to inform our strategy for this project. Um, Micron is also the co-chair of the Semi-Manufacturing Ownership Diversity Workgroup, which is a group um, that's organized under Semi, which is our industry's standards organization. But in this group, we work with our peers, customers, and suppliers to essentially develop best practices, drive awareness, drive adoption um, throughout our global supply chain. Okay, so over the last two decades, memory and storage has become more and more important. And Micron understands that we must take a leadership role, not only in the technology, but also in living our vision of transforming the way the world uses information to enrich life for all. So supplier diversity and inclusion is a lever for us to live that vision um, because for all really isn't just a statement, it's how we do business. And at Micron, you know, we believe that to truly innovate for the world, we need to reflect its diversity in every facet of our operations from our internal teams to our supply chain. So I'm personally so excited to be a part of the expansion efforts in central New York. Um, and as all of you are our future talent pipeline, <laughs> I hope you are too. Um, you know, with that, Micron is coming here. Um, we have several leaders from Micron in the audience, if you all want to raise your hands. <laughs> um, and most of us will be at the networking reception following this. So I would encourage you all to attend, come talk to us. Um, we want to hear from you. So thank you so much. It's been a, a real honor and a pleasure to be here. What I'd like to do now is introduce our uh, last speaker for the day, Michael Dominey. So Michael is a 1990 alum and a graduate of our supply chain program. He's a frequent and welcome speaker at our supply chain program event. Gartner is, um, Mike, Mike Domini is with, with Gartner. Um, but Gartner is a uh, industry, leading industry research organization. Um, they do a lot of research. They do a lot of publications in all areas of business. Michael is their vice president of supply chain research. And so we'd like to invite Michael to come up and talk to us about his area. Thanks, and uh, thanks everyone for coming, and it's great to be back. So I'm gonna talk about how supply chain not only is the enabler of growth, but actually drive new growth strategies. So this is gonna tie to somewhat to your presentation earlier. Um, I'm gonna walk through a couple of things, some foundational elements. We should have time at the end for questions as well. So within Gartner, we have practices that advise CIOs and IT leaders, CFOs, CHROs, so human resource officers, and of course, supply chain. I'm gonna share data from a couple of different sources. I'm gonna show you how supply chain can actually be a driver of growth. First, let me start with some data. So we surveyed our CFOs and we asked them, what are you gonna do about inflation? So we asked a couple of questions. So we had, and the same data applies in 2023. So we first asked, what are you gonna do in the, in the first six months of 2022? And you can see we listed a couple of things here. 54% of CFOs said, we're gonna increase prices. So we're gonna pass pricing on to the customers and the consumers. Interestingly, we asked, what are you gonna do when that runs out essentially? So in the second six months said, cut costs, focus on cost cutting. Now I can tell you from working with my CSCO clients around the world, we absolutely saw this happening. So the movement into extreme pressure right now on managing inventory and managing costs. 
This is not unfamiliar territory for us in supply chain though. Managing cost, cash, and service are fu fundamental elements. But let me take you into the growth piece of this. So what does this have to do with the growth element? In our CSEO signature study we did, looking at loyalty and the impact supply chain has on loyalty and repurchase rates. We asked a number of questions. So we surveyed over 1,600 businesses and consumers, and we asked them about their experiences and their actual buying activity, not what they would do, but what did they actually do from a buying perspective. And of course, we had to ask a number of questions. What happens when you increase prices? What we found is there's a 33%, a negative 33% impact on actual repurchasing. So you raise prices, negative 33% impact on actual buying. Now, here is one of the most important pieces of data that I've come across within our research for the past couple of years. What happens when the supply chain fails? A negative 87% impact on actual repurchase rates. I've always said my tagline is supply chain makes or breaks your business strategy. Supply chain makes or breaks your business. We now have data to show this. What do you use this for? I tell my CFO clients and CEO clients, use this data to fend off cost cuts and reductions in supply chain. And actually what this shows is you should invest in your supply chain organization because not doing so has a significantly larger impact on revenue. This is actual repurchase rates. So what do we do? How do we address this? There's kind of two fundamentals around how do we reduce or mitigate this disloyalty, this negative impact on revenue. First, customer satisfaction. Foundational fundamental elements. I'll talk you through that a bit. The new and interesting stuff is around supply chain customer enablement. So how the supply chain through the capabilities we build into it can actually be a driver of growth. And I'll show you the data on that as well. So let's talk about the fundamentals and the foundational elements. Of course, we need to drive customer satisfaction. We've all known this for a long time. When we talk about customer satisfaction, job one, what are the things that we looked at and the impacts and the levers they have, the impact on, on revenue growth? So we looked at service, quality, efficiency, reliability, issue resolution. These are all the things we need to do. These are table stakes. Well, what was the impact? on improving customer satisfaction. So if we work on those foundational elements, we do see an increase in the likelihood of repurchase rates. So getting up to the level of competitive parity is essential. And investing, if you're below median performance at least, in your on-time in full and other customer service metrics, there is a benefit for investing in these. So 30% 30, 30 increase in revenue, not to mention you're going to save costs and improve performance in other areas. So business case for improving on customer satisfaction, job one. However, our data also shows some interesting elements here. What you're seeing here, when we looked at those elements under customer satisfaction, we asked businesses and consumers, how satisfied are you with the supply chain performance relative to these aspects of your interactions and, and uh, relationships. And you see, there's not a lot of room for improvement. By and large, most businesses and consumers are pretty satisfied with the service that the supply chain is providing. Our perspective is that, you know, most people think we kind of invest more and more in exceeding customers' expectations, and we're gonna drive higher and higher levels of customer loyalty. That simply isn't true. There's a law of diminishing returns. We see this in our data in the supply chain practice. We also see this in our sales practice. So we advise heads of sales organizations within companies. And they actually did a study a couple of years ago looking at there's this law of diminishing returns where you can actually over invest in customer satisfaction. Key issue, what do you take away from all this? Of course, you have to drive customer satisfaction. Job one, maintaining the competitive baseline but there's not a lot of upside opportunity. It's the cost of entry. Let's turn to the growth driver piece, the customer enablement, how supply chain can be a driver of growth. 
what is customer enablement? So customer enablement through the lens of supply chain means a couple different things. To what degree can we provide customization? How are we collaborating? Are we collaborating with our customers? Are we making it effortless for our customers to buy from us and to interact with us? And our, how are we working on innovation? There's a, another element under this. If anybody's read any of the research around jobs to be done, this also applies there as well. So looking beyond just what the customer is expecting from us, buying from us, but what are they actually trying to accomplish when they buy something from us and how they're going to use it? More data. So customer satisfaction improvements drove a 30% increase in the likelihood of repurchase rates. So getting up to competitive parity. What happens when you enable your customers to accomplish the ultimate goal or job they want to have accomplished? We see a significantly larger bump on that as well. So we see a 2x multiplier. So if supply chain actually builds the capabilities that helps the customers accomplish the job they want accomplished, we can drive 2x multiplier on loyalty. And this is directly ties into repurchasing. So top line revenue growth, if we invest in the supply chain capabilities to, to enable our customers to accomplish the jobs they want to accomplish. Let me give you some examples. <clears throat> I'll give you a couple examples from the, the, the signature research we did. And I'll share a couple examples from way back in the day when I was doing this in operations, it still applies today. So first example, business to consumer example. So in this instance, um, I'm buying mini blinds for my dorm, my house, my apartment or whatever. This particular merchant, not only do they, they're gonna sell you the blinds that you want, right price, et cetera, but they have a way of enabling me as the customer. So I have different size windows in my condo. So I go in, I need to measure them. I need to buy the right sizes, et cetera. Get the right sizes ordered. In their order management process, they synchronize the different sizes of blinds that I need based on my measurements. They integrate that into their order fulfillment process. And what supply chain does is they actually label which mini blind goes into which, which window. So when I receive that shipment, the job I'm trying to accomplish is get mini blinds up in my condo. Knowing that I have the right mini blind for the right window is one of the things I have to accomplish. The supply chain organization at this company makes it easier for me to accomplish the job I'm try trying to accomplish, put the mini blinds up in the right place. And also it makes it easier for me it also reduces returns. These didn't fit and then buy the right ones, et cetera. So that's one example in the B2C space. In the, B2, the B2B space, uh, this is an example of a medical device manufacturer. So this company makes a whole range of medical devices, including um, ball and socket replacements for your hips, knees, shoulders, or what have you. What they do, so the job to be done is a replacement of a hip. Thank goodness I'm not that old and don't need my hip replaced yet. There's a whole process around this, right? So you have to go in and like, there are different size hips, there's different size joints. The surgeon is not a supply chain manager. Surgeon and the clinical staff are not experts in supply chain. They need to make sure though, when they're doing the procedure, that they have the right size ball and socket joints in the operating room. So what does this medical device manufacturer do? They partner with the surgeons in order to understand the upcoming procedures and they down select the proper assortment of ball and socket joints for that particular surgery and then delivers it in just in time for the surgery. This is an example of taking on a job to be done, taking it over and improving the loyalty and the satisfaction, so satisfaction plus the en enablement piece to drive a greater degree of repurchase rate or loyalty from the surgeons. So how do you move from just customer satisfaction and drive the next level up to customer enablement? 
there's a couple of key steps. The first one, listen and understand your customers. Well, duh, what does that mean? Why is that a problem? The vast majority of CSEOs and the teams I work with, they don't get to talk to their customers. They don't get to talk to their customers. The commercial teams often are a barrier for supply chain leaders talking to their customers and specifically their counterparts that are in the supply chain organizations downstream from them. But being able to actually engage and talk to those customers about what are the jobs that they are trying to accomplish is critical. Devote resources to customer uh, commercial innovation and manage it like a product. So being able to actually define the set of services that you are going to offer, the customer enablement services is critical. You have to manage them for certain customers, not all your customers, your top key accounts, you're going to do certain things with, you're not going to do this with everybody. Uh, let me give you an example of the listen and understand your customers. So this is um, one of the uh, companies in the Gartner Top 25. So this is, I can tell you who it is actually, because they, they talked about this in a public setting. So it was Johnson & Johnson. So Johnson & Johnson on their supply chain segmentation journey, trying to drive and prove loyalty, they actually brought their supply chain leaders in to meet with their supply chain leaders of their customers. And they met supply chain leader to supply chain leader. And as part of that process, they started uncovering a bunch of opportunities. What they found is the supply chain organizations for their downstream customers were doing things that were causing lots of headaches for J&J. &J. And they had no idea they were causing these issues. So they were doing things like ordering in weird quantities that made it very difficult for J and J to actually fulfill the demand. They're like, oh, we didn't know that was a problem. We can just change our order quantity. That's absolutely fine. So that's an example. Let me give you an example of customer enablement, my own kind of experience as well. So this is not a brand new concept per se, but the part around listening to your customers, enabling your customers jobs to be done. Really basic example. So my job and distribution operations when I worked at Kimberly Clark, we optimized cube out in our trucks. We made Kleenex facial tissue, really light stuff. So we had material handling equipment, paddle tractors, and slip sheets. Fill up the trailer, totally fill it up. It got downstream to our retail customers and they didn't have this kind of material handling equipment. So they had to hand unload all the products and put them on a pallet so it could go then downstream to the retail stores. This was unacceptable. We are extremely difficult to do business with. And they were going to take the, the many of our retail customers were going to take their business elsewhere. So what did we do? We instituted a palletization program, requ required changes on our operations upstream, but we were taking on the job to be done, making it more efficient for our retail customers to actually move product through their warehouse and ultimately down to the stores. So I buzz through that pretty quickly. I'm gonna summarize with a couple key points and then definitely have time for questions about this or anything you wanna chat about. So a couple key steps, roadmap around supply chain driven growth and loyalty. Job one, get the, the fundamentals right. So put the foundations in place, get your on time in full damage free, et cetera, in place, customer effort and ease. That will drive a 30% improvement in supply chain performance if you're getting up to at least the baseline. The customer enablement piece is then drive the next level through um, making it easier for the customers to accomplish the jobs they need, need to get done. So moving from an inside out to what we call an outside in orientation, meeting with the downstream customers, understanding what they're ultimately trying to accomplish. So with that, I'm going to think of wrap up now and take some questions it's really kind of two of the, the foundations I described, supply chain customer satisfaction first, supply chain customer enablement. Key points I made, getting the, the foundations right first. Don't go after supply chain customer enablement until you get your uh, on time in full and other service metrics in place. Take this data and use it with the rest of the C-suite and even the board to not only fend off cost cuts and cost reductions, 
and staff cuts within your supply chain organization, but use it as evidence to support actually investing more in the supply chain organization. Get approval to start engaging with customers. Easy for me to say this, as I described this very, very difficult. You have to start small and usually folks will start with their commercial teams to begin with. And then make enablement as part of your product portfolio, your product offering. These are a set of services that you offer in order to drive improved uh, throughput for your customers, improve revenue for your customers, make it easier for them to do their jobs. But you can't do this across all of your customers and customer base. With that, I know we have time for questions. We do have time for questions. Any questions for Michael? Yes. Hi, thank you. This was very informative. Uh, so if you're able to go back to your slide on customer repurchase um, uh, drivers. This one? Um, perhaps two back. Let's go back. Another one. So it is the slide 33% uh, versus 87% decline in uh, customer repurchase. This, this one. one? So, yep. uh, so this is, I believe, from 2021, data collected throughout 2021. Do you think this is, this is due to the pandemic? What you're seeing here is the, this 87 is a bit uh, higher than what we might normally observe in a uh, time of non-crisis, and this is due to the COVID. What, what do you think? Um, I think there was certainly some impact or influence on that, sure. Um, we still see the same the same results though in 2022, et cetera. Um, I think the data would be a little bit different if we looked at it in 2020, right? So we we did the the survey the end of 2021 and and the results came out in 2022. So I, I don't I don't think, you know, and perhaps the the percentages might change a little bit, but the the point really that you're seeing is consumers and customers value the impact of supply chain significantly more than the price increases. Um, and in some, some other slides, I believe there was this distinction between the uh, uh, retail customer and the yeah. uh, corporate customers. In this one, this, this uh, repurchase, repurchase one, yep. if we go back to the repurchase one, what does uh, minus eight to seven, is it the corporate customers or the uh, retail the, the The one I was on just before, that was uh -huh. a, a combination of the two and you actually see a fairly similar multiplier on it. So we rolled all the data together, this one you're asking about from before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's the entire sample. So we have it mixed together. We did not see a statistically, and the reason we're, we'll show that together, we did not see a st statistically significant difference between B2C and B2B relative to the price um, uh, increase number on the 33% and the 87% negative impact, right? So this is the negative side. The second part of the, what I presented is the positive side, right? If you improve on customer satisfaction, if you improve on customer enablement, this, you know, again, I think the, the 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 takeaway on this is you're probably better off, <laughs> generally speaking, from this this data, increasing prices versus having you know negatively impacting your supply chain performance around reliability of service. So again, I think the 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 coaching I use with clients around this is this kind of data should speak effectively with the CEO, CEO, CFO, et cetera, around why we won't, don't want to shortchange the supply chain organization. Other questions, does that help? Okay. Um, Mike, when you say the supply chain quality, what does that quality actually refer to? Yeah, so it's the these, oh, sorry, quality. Yeah. So that is, um, Things like, is it damage free? Did we deliver it on time? Other elements around the, the quality aspects of it. So you see uh, the delivery time, time shift packaging. Okay. Um, it's it's what usually the, the main element is around damage. Also around, um, did I have to work really difficultly, difficultly to engage with you and actually buy from you? So oh, quality, part of quality is, is the actual purchase of it as well. Yeah. 
Yes. Okay. Interesting. Yep. So this question is actually for uh, Gartner, but also uh, for, for Micron and Coca-Cola. Uh, you're presenting really fascinating uh, insights. Um, our students these days are really interested in using data or uh, to, 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 or, or learning skills for working with data. Do your companies have data sets that you can make available to our students or you do make available, which we can use in our teaching or or they can use to learn more about how to do these kinds of different kinds of analyses and, and address problems of the types that you work with. So there is certain data that is available. So most of this is from a client perspective. So for example, um, we forecast IT spending. So that, for example, that is available to clients, right? Not, a, not available, at least not to my knowledge, freely in the public domain. Um, as you can imagine, right, this is our IP, right? So um, going out and you know, running these surveys and collecting this data, and we spend money to do that, right, is, is part of like what, how we deliver the insights for, for clients. So not all of it's available. I will share with you, we do use, so like the, the study you, you were sharing, um, publicly available data in, in uh, a, a bunch of our research, in particular in our supply chain top 25, rankings. So we use a set of metrics within that to, to calculate that. And there's a kind of a weighted score, but we use the, those public data sets. But I can certainly check to see if there's anything that's in the public domain that's available. Other questions? Like I said, Gartner does research on in every area of, of industry for the most part, correct? Yeah, sorry. Uh, Gartner is an organization does research in all aspects of um, industry. Yes. So, you know, sales, finance, HR, IT. I work with clients across the board and um, across geographies and industries as well. Other questions? Yeah. End of the day, everyone's really tired. I know. It's been a very uh, busy day. Okay, no other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Okay, that actually wraps up our program for today. Um, I want to thank all of our recipients of the Salzburg program for coming here up here to Syracuse. Uh, they come from Atlanta, come from Pennsylvania, and making that trip. We really appreciate it. We want to thank our invited guest speakers that have also made their way here to Syracuse. We really appreciate your insight, your presentation, your time in preparing for that. We wanna thank our supply chain advisory board for the advice that they give us. We have a nice advisory board as well. Uh, our student speakers who spent a lot of time putting this presentation together. I thought they did a fine job on their presentation too, by the way. Um, they were here well past so midnight for many, many nights down here practicing uh, to get this thing right. So we appreciate that. I also want to thank all the people behind the scenes that you don't see. You see a few people up here, but I can tell you there's probably three times as many people you see behind the scenes you don't see that make this thing all work. We have IT people that are making this um, all happen properly. We've got the um, Mike Haney and um, Dean McKelvey, their support for for organizing the facilities and so forth and for and for supporting this whole program. We've got the people who order all the awards and order all the food and order all the plaques and everything. And there's there's many people, it's too many people to even count, but there's a lot of people that actually make this happen. We wanna thank all those people for doing that. I wanna thank my co-director, Julie, as well, for putting in all her time and organizing this event. And we have another event tomorrow, it just, just focuses on the academic aspect of it. So. Years ago, this was actually a multi-day, a three-day program. It was really um, this aspect of it, but then we had several days of uh, lectures and academic um, um, contributions. So we've kind of got back to that, and that's what tomorrow is going to be. And Professor Fisher will be speaking along with some other of his colleagues tomorrow as well, correct? Okay. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it.